Hello, and welcome to the public workshop on COVID-19 Lessons Learned, the Clinical Evaluation of Therapeutics. I am Susan Winkler and have the privilege of serving as the Chief Executive Officer of the Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA. The FDA Foundation is pleased to host this important discussion to share information that's relevant today, but also helps us be better prepared for the next public health emergency. I'm going to open with just a few light housekeeping announcements. We have more than a thousand people registered for today's workshop, and we are so pleased that each of you could join us. If you would like to ask our speakers a question, please post those in the Q&A function, and we will get to as many as we can. For those who submitted questions as part of the registration process, we have provided those to the panel moderators. Note, however, that none of today's speakers will be addressing any pending regulatory action or answering any questions regarding such actions. If we look at our agenda, you will see that we are scheduled to go from 1 until 5.30, and we have not scheduled a break. We fully expect that you may need to take one, and please do. From a content perspective, uh, Drs. Woodcock and Collins will get us started this afternoon, covering the landscape for the work thus far, looking back, as well as providing a look forward. We'll then organize our discussion in three categories, with a panel discussion of each, looking at research scoping and prioritization, infrastructure and resourcing, and clinical trial execution. Following the panels, we'll open the microphone for public comment to those who signed up in advance. We will call on registered commenters alphabetically and we'll unmute your microphone so that you may be heard. Each speaker in the public comment period will be limited to one and a half minutes. We will close your microphone at that 90 second mark. Please note that neither the FDA Foundation nor the agency will respond to questions during that time period. And again, throughout the event, government employees will not comment on any pending or other regulatory action. With that, we can jump into the content because we have a lot of discussion to stimulate today. I'm going to turn the microphone over to my co-moderator, Dr. Kevin Bugin. Um, he's currently the Acting Director of Operations in CEDARS Office of New Drugs at FDA, but was formerly part of the Federal COVID-19 Response Team, which was uh, also known as Operation Warp Speed. Kevin, you've been instrumental in much of the work that we're going to discuss today. Would you provide us an, an introduction and prepare us for what we're about to cover in the next few hours? Absolutely. Thank you, Susan. Really appreciate the introduction and really appreciate all the work that's gone into today's workshop, both from the Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA in organizing and getting us to this point today. I mean, it's really been a pleasure to work with you, but also to our panel members and, of course, our panel organizers who have also been working group leads throughout this entire initiative to gather the lessons learned and generate some initial recommendations for how we might proceed uh, within this current pandemic and future pandemic or public health emergencies. And of course, I want to really thank all of our participants today. As you heard, we have more than a thousand registered attendees. I do hope they'll join as well throughout the day. And it's, it's with your contributions that we'll really be able to achieve our goal today, which is to quite simply expand the circle of the stakeholders who've been working with myself and, and Dr. Woodcock these past many months to share our lessons and recommendations on how to move forward with improvements and also to get your input and your feedback. We really do value that. And I want to just point out that there will be a uh, open or there is already an open docket that we can receive your comments, your questions. Um, we've received several already prior to today, and I'm sure we'll receive more. And that docket will remain open for the rest of the year, I believe, and we'll be pulling in those comments uh, at the end when the docket closed to sort of summarize and, and add those into the additional public discussion. So as Susan mentioned, uh, what we'll be covering today is lessons and recommendations related to those three topic areas around how do we research, scope, and prioritize the coordinated therapeutic evaluation activities? And then what's the necessary infrastructure and resourcing that's needed and really needed, period? It's not something that you can develop during or after the pandemic. You need it from the get-go. You're either early or you're late, and we simply cannot be late. And lastly, then what's necessary for efficient and effective execution of clinical trials? In these three topic areas, we'll go through a number of some of those insights and lessons learned and potential recommendations that we've been generating with our panelists. So 
Um, as a reminder, why we, did we conduct this workshop? Well, the, the intent was really to um, provide an additional uh, perspective and gather additional insights into this process of getting feedback on these lessons learned and really disseminate these findings out across the entire public ecosystem because we recognize we've been having great conversations and a lot of convergence on many of these issues, but it's something that we need to take further. So what's next? Well, as I mentioned, I think already today is really a step in our journey. And what we're trying to do today is really talk about change. And change is never a one-time event. It's a continuous process. And to keep that process moving in the right direction, we need as much insight and as many varieties of perspectives as possible. I think as you'll hear from my colleague, Dr. Janet Woodcock, in a moment, these lesson learned efforts that we've been engaged in is really a culmination of a series of those discussions and collaborative activities that have been occurring over the past many months and really reflecting on that first year of the pandemic. And what we'll try to do today is kind of just take stock of where we were, where we are and where we're going. So lastly, just a few reminders, there will be a recording of today's meeting. The slides I believe are already available on the Reagan Udall Foundation website uh, where you initially registered. We will also have a interim summary document that will build on the pre-read document, which is also already available on the RUF website. And that summary document will incorporate today's discussions. And lastly, as I mentioned earlier, as the docket closes later this year, we'll be summarizing some of that public feedback as well to add into that ongoing discussion. So lastly, with great honor and pleasure, let me go ahead and introduce someone who really needs no introduction, Dr. Janet Woodcock. So please join me in welcoming our Acting Commissioner of Food and Drugs at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Hi, Janet. Hey, thanks, Kevin, and hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be talking about this, and could I have the first slide? So my task is to go back to the beginning and say, how, how did we decide, how did we uh, do what we did, and what did we learn as we did the things we did? So. Uh, I was the therapeutic lead for what was then called Operation Warp Speed, and um, it started with uh, Kevin and me <laughs> um, trying to figure out uh, what to do. And so I think we did. We gained a tremendous number of insights as, as we moved along. And of course, we worked with other components of the government. You'll hear from Dr. Collins in a bit about how we uh, joined up with ACTIVE and were able to accomplish a great deal uh, through that collaboration. Next slide. So <clears throat> um, the, it was established in May, the therapeutics uh, warp speed effort to try and pick out candidates and then uh, accelerate their clinical, both their clinical development and the scale up of their manufacturing. Uh, and so it was sort of a crystal ball exercise to move forward and support those candidates that would most likely have a broad uh, impact on the pandemic. And then try to enable broad distribution and availability of the, these therapeutics until widespread access could be achieved. And in fact, it has turned out that we are still needing these. We knew there would be people who would not get vaccinated and people for whom the vaccine would not be effective. And so there would be an ongoing need um, while the virus was still spreading around for therapeutics. And <clears throat> We wanted to provide continued access for all of these across, no matter where you were, public access. And so we focused, uh, we decided to focus on candidates that uh, attack the virus, number one, uh, particularly the monoclonals or small molecule antivirals, because um, there was a huge effort going on with a lot of immunomodulators and there uh, a number of those were put in the portfolio, but it was hard to sort through those. And then uh, prevent or manage complications such as thrombosis, uh, which uh, was an early uh, um, thing we, had, we worked on. And in January of 21, Operation Warp Speed was transitioned to the federal COVID-19 response, but uh, continued to have the same mission. Next slide. So this slide is probably hard to see, but the point of this is that we worked across many, many uh, agencies and groups in the government, not only the HHS agencies, but DOD, Veterans Affairs, uh, and many others to all work together. And this um, turned out to be very effective. We leaned on and had leads uh, of different uh, therapeutic programs for many 
places around the government. It was very, it was really extraordinary, I think. Um, next slide. So um, we learned a lot as we did all this, uh, particularly about how one might um, clinically evaluate, bring forward and clinically evaluate therapeutics during the midst of a pandemic. Or, uh, and the insights were uh, driven by much of the frustration that all of us encountered in actually setting up and getting going uh, the, this clinical evaluation. And, and we were like starving in the midst of plenty. We had people um, ill in ICUs all over the country and yet we couldn't enroll patients as fast as we really felt we, we should be able to do. And most of the patients were not um, put toward um, trials that could yield actionable information. And so we learned uh, slower than we should have. And in fact, um, you know, manufacturing of course and making clinical supplies was also problematic, but there were tremendous uh, barriers that it took many, many people, uh, thousands of hours to work through these. And we think these insights can be applied to the broader clinical trial landscape in the United States and improve our preparedness for the next public health emergency, but also teach us more about how to more effectively um, have a, a learning healthcare system to actually uh, rapidly evaluate interventions. So, um, so there continues, of course, to be a public health emergency, but by, by 2021, it seemed like we didn't want to just move on and lose those insights of those, those early days of tremendous struggle. And so from January to May, um, we collected and analyzed um, uh, lessons learned from all these parties who had participated and more. Next slide, please. So over the course of the first half, we captured these lessons learned. We developed some recommendations and considerations for implementation. Uh, we did a huge number of interviews with many, many helpers that I'll get to in a minute. And we got a 70 page uh, fact-based uh, document about all the different lessons learned and the documentation. Then we synthesized that into 29 key lessons learned. And we had working groups uh, and leadership who uh, led these activities and we had uh, internal workshops and meetings and so forth. And then um, <clears throat> we developed uh, to ways to address the recommendations to, and provide details and references for implementation process that was really a starting point. Like, okay, if we're going to change this, what do we know now? What do we think? What, where could we go from here? Next slide. So we formed um, working groups around these uh, key topic areas. I have the leadership group. It's, so it was across uh, military, JPEO, um, VA. Uh, we had a lead, um, we had VARDA involved, NIH and FDA. So we had a huge um, uh, span of people who were all working together. And then we had leads from all the different groups shown below, both the FNIH, FDA and so forth and so on, all these people working together. And then uh, we had a lot of partners, external partners who helped uh, by collecting information from their organizations, for example, ACRO, which is the uh, CRO organization, um, Bio and Pharma, the biopharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical industries, and a large number of other groups who helped us um, collect collect all this information and bring their point of view to bear as well. Next slide. So then we, um, lessons learned were organized into five topic areas with four of those going to, we're going to be discussing today. First one was, you know, when Kevin and I started uh, 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 strategy governance and decision-making were extremely uh, confusing to us and, um, you know, how, um, 
we feel that governance and coordination really needs to be set up in advance and so forth. And that will be discussed uh, in, one, uh, in one group. Um, then how do you pick among this myriad of candidates uh, and really do the scoping and uh, agent selection and so forth, um, evidence generation strategy and data sharing? We managed it and ACTIVE had an agent selection group in BARDA and uh, our therapeutics group had agent selection, but we were, everyone was bombarded with thousands of candidate agents, either those in development or ones that wanted to be repurposed and uh, figuring out a process even for, um, for working with all of these was complicated. And then research on how do we compare similar agents such as uh, the monoclonals, of course, which many of them are, were against different epitopes and how did they work against the various variants and what was uh, what were their properties? And so we uh, worked with uh, FDA and uh, the Scripps Institute and uh, all sorts of parties, the Gates Foundation and so forth, as well as NIH to try and get a handle on the properties of a number of these uh, molecules that we finally ended up testing. Um, also um, looking at animal models and their performance and trying to do head-to-head -head studies in the animal model. So we had some comparative data to work from. But again, this was all back of the envelope. <laughs> we, we did this as we went. Uh, there was no really, um, you know, game plan laid out for, for us to do this. And then infrastructure and resourcing, like um, <clears throat> a lot of effort had to go in. We brought in, uh, ACTIVE brought in a lot of the uh, clinical trial networks and identified a lot of the clinical trial networks uh, that NIH had. Um, but, you know, we really didn't have the clinical trial infrastructure that we needed uh, to cover the United States. And we um, did struggle with diverse participation, partly because of the sites uh, where the sites were located. Um, and the CRO infrastructure uh, in the United States was, I think, pretty stressed by all the trials that were going on. So um, it was, uh, this was quite a, an issue. And then clinical trial execution. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, this usually takes about six to eight months or whatever to set up a clinical trial in the government or elsewhere even. Um, to, to get everything, all the sign-offs, everything that needed to be done. And we had, we tried to accelerate that as quickly as possible, but there were tremendous uh, barriers. And then we're not gonna talk about supply distribution administrations, but administration, but there are many lessons learned there as well. Next one, please. <clears throat> so, um, and finally, in closing, you know, many of the therapeutics lessons learned that we are going to discuss today can be found at a high level, I think, in the recently shared President's Pandemic Preparedness Plan. Um, they call for strengthening the U.S. public health system, investing in public health labs and digital infrastructure. Another thing that we lacked uh, was really uh, being able to rapidly identify what variants were circulating in the United States and whether our agents we were developing would be active against them, a prioritization of vulnerable communities and making sure they're able to participate in clinical research, really important, and evidence-based communication. We did struggle. <laughs> we struggled with getting publicity on the trials and also getting people to understand they needed to use the monoclonal antibodies and that they could keep people out of the hospitals and so forth. Improve the regulatory capacity, um, platform technologies to, um, uh, for, for example, manufacturing uh, so that you're not reinventing the wheel all the time. Clinical trial networks, if, if we had had ready to use networks that were more extensive uh, and in the appropriate communities, we could have been up and running uh, much faster, had a much broader reach, and then improved regulatory capacity approaches at FDA. Of course, FDA did not have surge capacity. It usually runs very close to the bone as far as staffing and so forth, and, and um, this uh, caused huge increases in workload for the regulators. 
and then enhanced program management, which gets to what we talked, what I talked about at the beginning, the first item, um, you know, decision rights, who's in charge, what are the structures uh, for decisions and so forth. And they call for uh, enhanced program management, a mission control function, which would be very useful and international coordination. Now the FDA ran a lot of international coordination itself uh, with uh, regulator, uh, drug regulators around the world, but um, obviously there needed to be even broader coordination. Next slide. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to the moderators. Uh, this is just setting the stage, I think, for the questions. Absolutely. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Woodcock. I'm, I'm reminded we've certainly benefited from your in, in, inimitable leadership style and scientific acumen throughout this public health emergency at Warp Speed and now at, at, at FDA. I was struck by two components in your overview that it's important to take time, even in the midst of an ongoing pandemic response effort, to take a snapshot and dig into the issues and come up with recommendations before our memory and the information changes too quickly. And then as well, struck by the all of government and private sector engagement in the effort to aspire to make sure that the collaborative work was collaboratively reviewed. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, that we have some of this being implemented today to adapt our ongoing response. Is that is that fair? I think that's all fair. I mean, it was really breathtaking, the uh, extent of collaboration across all the sectors. I would credit Kevin Bugin for the idea that we really need to do lessons learned quickly because, of course, he was always in the middle of all these administrative problems and how we're going to solve them. Um, yes, but it um, it uh, was was really spectacular the collaboration across all the sectors, and uh, I think it was a sign that you know everyone put down their their parochial needs and so forth and uh, put their shoulder to the wheel. So it was uh, it was a very positive experience in that way. But it would have benefited from more uh, clarity. Uh, some This mission control is a very good idea, in other words, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, appreciate that. And we'll look forward to hearing you back on panel number one. Um, but I will go ahead and take us to our second opening speaker. And this is where we will hear from uh, Director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Francis Collins. And you've been similarly quite involved in all of these efforts. Um, and I uh, know that you have um, a, a presentation also to walk us through. I'm gonna get out of the way and turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, Dr. Collins, for joining us today. Well, thank you. Well, thanks very much uh, for kind words, uh, Susan, and thanks to Kevin for all the hard work in prepping us uh, for today's workshop. But special thanks uh, to Janet Woodcock, who's just been a fantastic partner as we have struggled through these last uh, 21 months of the worst pandemic in more than 100 years, trying to steer our agencies in the direction that would do the most good to try to help the public. And Janet has been tireless wise and extremely capable in her management of FDA. And there've been many times uh, where she and I have had to communicate <laughs> at strange hours uh, to try to figure out how to make the system work. And she has never failed uh, to come forward with a creative solution. So Janet, it's been terrific being your partner through this. And now we can partner in figuring out what the lessons are and how to learn from them. And I thought I would say a little bit about that uh, as sort of, again, a bit of a queuing up of the panels who are going to dig more deeply into all of these issues. And it's a great group of people on those panels. So I'm looking forward to hearing what they think about all of this. You ended with a remark about the president's uh, pandemic preparedness plan coming from the White House just this month. This month. Um, 
a bold one, shall we say, with a bold price tag. Uh, but let's let's admit that if we're really serious about preparing for the next pandemic, while we're still trying to finish dealing with this one, it's going to take resources. The, what's in that plan, which is well worth your careful perusal, uh, are these five different areas that you see listed here on the slide. But most of what we're talking about today relates to that first one, transforming medical defenses through vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. But none of that works if we don't achieve goals in the other places as well. The public health systems, the situational awareness for monitoring, the core cap cap capabilities we need, and yes, mission control, a way in which this can all be managed in an effective, seamless way, including our international connections. So again, if you want more details about that, I would refer you to the actual document. A lot of work went into uh, the ideas that are put forward there that we are certainly enthusiastic about seeing uh, the implementation. But I want to reflect a bit on COVID-19 initiatives that NIH uh, had a particularly heavy role in, although all of these ended up only being successful because of partnerships. There are five here that I could go on about, and I will speak at least a little bit about each of them, except I won't talk about RADx, the second one, which is about diagnostics, because our real focus today is on therapeutics and their clinical testing. But let me walk you through some of those experiences. Beginning with ACTIVE, which Janet has already mentioned, and which FDA and Janet herself was a very significant part of, Turn the clock back to March of 2020 and survey what's happening at that point in terms of therapeutics for this rapidly spreading worldwide pandemic caused by SARS-CoV-2. As I looked across that landscape and saw the efforts that were being made, all very well-intentioned in therapeutics, it was scattershot. Uh, in fact, I think we used that word regularly when looking at that landscape. There were many, many small scale trials that were sort of based upon a hopeful view that repurposing of some compound that might potentially have value, oftentimes based on fairly shaky uh, data, uh, might just turn out to be the thing uh, that would save lives as lives were rapidly being challenged by COVID-19. Many of those trials were too small to have any real chance uh, of having a meaningful result. They often were not particularly well designed as far as what the endpoints were. And a vast number of them were working on the same thing, hydroxychloroquine, uh, without really working together to try to build what would be a more definitive trial. There was also a big effort on convalescent plasma, but not organized as a randomized control, but as an open label effort, which in retrospect, it's really unfortunate that we didn't manage to get that off on the right foot. Looking at this, uh, talking to Janet, uh, talking to my colleagues in academia and in industry, we all came to the conclusion, this is not the way we are going to tackle this terrible threat uh, to our country, to our planet. And so in April, by pulling together very quickly partners across multiple agencies and very explicitly reaching out to our colleagues in industry, we launched ACTIVE, the Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines Public-Private Partnership, an unprecedented one to try, as you can see from the mission here, to really collaborate on prioritizing the therapeutic candidates that needed to be evaluated and to do so rigorously, uh, to come up with clinical trial capabilities, coordinate the regulatory process, do all of that, and do it at a pace that had not previously been necessary, but now certainly was. The stakeholders, now that ACTIVE has been around for a year and a half uh, and is still very much involved in this, we'll have our next leadership team meeting of ACTIVE day after tomorrow. Uh, and it is populated not by people far down in the organizations, but in many instances by the heads of the organizations that you see here or their deputies. 20 companies now taken part in ACTIVE. Eight government agencies, as you can see here, nonprofits, and very importantly, with program management provided by the Foundation for NIH with their remarkable skill sets there. And you'll hear about that from a couple of those, Stacey Adam and Mike Santos in the first panel, who are part of the program management capabilities that FNIH brought to this active issue. Stacey, 
for therapeutics, uh, might for vaccines. Active did get involved in vaccines by playing a significant role in the design of the master protocols. So when you notice that most of the vaccines that have gotten rigorous testing have tended to follow the same protocol in terms of what the endpoints were and the size of the study and so on, well, that's because that's how Active working with industry partners and FDA uh, designed this as the way to get the answer you could trust. And I can't say enough about how critical it was that FDA was at the table in all of these master protocol plans so that we knew we had something that would stand up uh, to intense regulatory oversight. Active broke up into four different subgroups, preclinical, therapeutics clinical, clinical trial capacity, and vaccines. Uh, the therapeutics clinical maybe is the one I'll focus on most here, uh, given that we don't have a lot of time. One of their tasks was to look at this landscape of possible therapeutic agents and try to prioritize which of those ought to most quickly get into rigorous randomized controlled trials. We started with about 600 of those and they had to be looked at each one of them to see what was the evidence and the likelihood that they could be successful. And that meant what's the scientific basis of the claim for benefit but also something uh, more practical, like suppose it works, is there a manufacturing plan about how you could actually develop a, a supply chain and provide this to people if you had a successful outcome? They went through all of that, uh, prioritizing, starting with hundreds, uh, coming down uh, to dozens, and ultimately we've now tested more than 20 different therapeutic agents as part of active master protocols. And the therapeutics clinical group also designed those master protocols. So they were pretty busy. Uh, clinical trial capacity group faced with, okay, how do we actually do this? Looked at all of those trial networks, some run by NIH, some by industry, some of course in CROs, and tried to imagine how you could take this very disparate group of trial networks, many focused on something other than infectious disease, and ask them to get ready in a matter of weeks uh, to begin enrolling patients in a master protocol that maybe they didn't design, but was gonna be handed to them with the request to run it just like this. And that happened in a way that was at times a bumpy <laughs> along the road, but in enormously willingness was encountered on the part of all those who had to drop everything uh, to take part in this, and they did so. I think we did learn is that it would have been good if we'd had such a national, let's say international clinical trial network that was being kept warm all the time to take on a public health emergency like this. We didn't have that. We had to kind of create it. And that was not easy. But again, the willingness of people uh, to go in a new direction was remarkable. So what came out of that? Here are the six master protocols, one through six, although some of them have subsets. I'm not going to walk you through much. You can see just in terms of the compounds, that are listed here, the therapeutics, uh, those that are in green have, were shown to have uh, efficacy in randomized controlled trials. Uh, the ones in red uh, failed, basically. They were given up because of futility. It's also good to know when something doesn't work. And the others uh, that are in either color that are in white are currently ongoing. So we're still very much in the middle of this. This morning, the war room uh, for active met as we do regularly and uh, we looked at the list of meetings of active working groups uh, this week. I think there were 32 of them uh, just this week. So this is a very ongoing, intense effort. So what did we learn about this? Well, we also did learn things that don't work. And as I mentioned, that's extremely important to have that list. We know that the things that you see here are probably not going to be uh, things that should be propagated. One of the surprises, I'll just point to the next to last one, is that monoclonal antibodies, despite our best hopes that they would be the way we could rescue people who are really sick in the hospital with COVID-19, they all kind of failed in inpatient trials. And I think the reason for that is by that point, uh, the patient's immune system had already generated their own antibodies and adding additional ones apparently was not really going to make that much difference. Where monoclonals worked was an outpatient shortly after diagnosis, and there many lives have been saved by access uh, to those, even though the uh, awkwardness of the, of the delivery, because it has to be intravenous or occasionally intramuscular, uh, made it more difficult uh, to actually come up with a way in our medical care system to readily uh, do so. If I had to summarize sort of the big picture then of what we learned 
about therapeutics for COVID-19 from all of this. It's that antiviral strategies uh, like monoclonals work best early on. And we think that's probably gonna be true for small molecule antivirals as well, which I'll come to in a second. Whereas immunomodulatory strategies, dexamethasone being the most dramatic, uh, but there are others also that have showed promise here, seem not to be the thing you'd wanna give early on. You want your immune system to be working hard at that point. But by the time somebody's in the ICU, their problem at that point is more overreaction of the immune system than it is ongoing viral infection. And their immunomodulation can in fact be important and can save lives. Anticoagulation has been really interesting because we did learn early on that this virus is quite capable of promoting thromboses in small vessels and anticoagulants therefore seem to be a really good idea. What we do know is that they do provide benefit early in hospitalized patients but not later on after organ failure has happened. So you have to be very selective about exactly how and when you administer that kind of therapy. We never would have figured that out without the rigorous trials in that case carried out in active form. What about antivirals? Many of us would have hoped uh, a year ago to have a whole menu of very targeted small molecule antivirals directed against uh, some weak spot in SARS-CoV-2's ability to replicate itself. We didn't have those. So everything was done in those active protocols to repurpose compounds that had been developed for other reasons, hoping that they would work in this regard. And we had, to use a baseball analogy, a single or a double here and there, but we didn't have any home runs. And what we need now are the home runs. And so the APP, which is now underway, funded by the American Rescue Plan, aims to do that, uh, working between NIH, academia, and industry to basically build a sustainable platform to discover new antivirals, starting with COVID-19, but ultimately with other potential pathogens as well, bringing together experts into these multidisciplinary discovery groups called AVID centers, and using both drug design uh, by structural principles and also high throughput screens with various assays to find compounds that have promise. Many of them focused on the proteases that the virus needs in order to process itself and which are virally encoded. So if you attack those, you should have both efficacy and low toxicity. All of that is planned in the APP and which is now vigorously underway, but has not yielded the kind of immediate fruit that we wish we'd had a year ago. This is a quick diagram of the coronavirus uh, life cycle, just to say there are a number of places here where a small molecule could be quite effective in terms of blocking replication. And the protease inhibitors are uh, at the moment uh, the favorite one, along with polymerase inhibitors that are also being pursued. A little lesson here for the future, if we already know a list of perhaps the 20 most likely potential pandemic pathogens that might be lurking out there waiting for us, maybe we should start now uh, to develop those small molecule antivirals, especially those that are potent enough to affect an entire class of viruses, not just a specific one. And then we'd be a lot further along uh, preparing for that next pandemic. And that is in fact part of the plan that I started off mentioning that the White House has put forward uh, to deal with pandemic, pandemic future. One other thing to mention in terms of something that ACTIVE was able to put together and now has become a very prominent part of what we're doing is to track the development of variants uh, in SARS-CoV-2 that carry significance, both in terms of how they transmit, how contagious they are, but especially how they affect therapeutics, monoclonal antibodies, vaccines as well. And certainly you wanna have a systematic way of tracking those and pulling together as quickly as possible the assays of how they affect function of therapeutics and of vaccines. That's what TRACE is now doing and it's helpful because industry is part of this and of course they're intensely interested in functional consequences of these variants of things like Delta and Mu. All of that is now being held together in a component of ACTIVE called TRACE, uh, which has an open database where you can go and find a lot of information about what we know about all of the variants that are currently circulating. And then another really important issue 
uh, before I come to conclusions, was the concern about whether in the clinical trials that need to be done, are we successfully reaching out to the groups that have been hit hardest with COVID-19? We all know that this pandemic has shown a bright and very troubling light on health disparities and that groups that already were not being well cared for in our health system were shouldering a burden of this disease in terms of hospitalizations and deaths that was sometimes two or three times greater than the more privileged groups. And so if we are gonna run clinical trials to see if therapeutics or vaccines are working, you wanna be sure you are inclusive of participation. For that effort, we mounted over a year ago, something called SEAL, the NIH Community Engagement Alliance, recognizing that running clinical trials when the management comes from the top, uh, maybe somewhere far away, is not necessarily the way you win the trust of communities to take part in those trials. You really want people on the ground who know those communities, who have an understanding of their concerns to be your partners. And that's what SEAL has tried to do. Now in more than 20 states, as you can see at the bottom, uh, figuring out how best to tap into uh, those experts, those knowledgeable members of the community to help us as we do that outreach. And I think what you saw happen, particularly with the vaccine trials, when a very short order, you wanted to get 30,000 participants and to have the representation be something similar to our country, we started out way behind on that and with a big push uh, from SEAL and, and making this a high priority, not just a nice thing to have. Uh, many of those achieved 35, 40% racial and ethnic minorities. And we ought to set that as a goal going forward for all of our clinical trials. SEAL can help with that, but there's lots of other efforts in this space as well. So to conclude, I think it's fair to say we have made substantial and rapid progress in prioritizing and testing therapeutics. That was something that was missing uh, in April of 2020 and rapidly got pulled together. And it was remarkable to have people willing to drop everything uh, active with those four working groups, more than 100 people who pretty much 24 seven were devoted to this effort. And that was a lot of intense work to try to set those priorities uh, for therapeutics. And we were working against, as I point out in the second bullet here, well-intentioned but poorly designed and underpowered trials that were wasting a lot of our clinical trial capacity. Uh, we have learned a, <clears throat> a lesson there, and NIH is a main funder of some of the infrastructure that supports academic medical centers. Uh, we have a role to play here, I think, to try to be sure that that lesson gets learned and we don't, once again, in the future, uh, find so much of our energies being expended in ways that are unlikely to provide the kind of data that's going to change the course of an illness. We did, as I showed you, uh, through uh, these master protocols and clinical trial networks and prioritizing therapeutics, find multiple therapies that have been beneficial, particularly monoclonals, and a lot of others that had no value, and it was good to know that too. The repurposing of existing drugs, you always want to try that, but you can't expect that necessarily. Uh, to be the answer. So as soon as possible, developing and testing targeted drugs that are really focused on the pathogen. And I didn't mention this, but it's certainly likely, even if we do get good antivirals, that they may need to be used in combination to have full effect and not to have resistance rapidly develop. Remember what happens with HIV. This is a different virus, but the same principle could apply. And then the many lessons for me, having been pretty much 100 hours a week devoted to COVID-19 for the last 20 months, the only way we got to where we are is because of these partnerships, the willingness of people really to ignore previous senses about boundaries and to recognize what can we do together that is going to advance the cause of public health. And it was wonderful to have that opportunity more broadly shared, not worry too much about who's going to get the credit and figure out how to do this in a way that was going to be rigorous. It would be something you could really trust and believe the results. And that's a lesson that we learned, but we could have done it a lot faster if we'd been expecting that something like this might be necessary. So please, as we hope to see COVID-19 eventually in the rearview mirror, let's not forget the lessons learned. That's what we're here to talk about today. Let's try to have uh, a different view and then we have often had in the past where we go from panic to complacency. Uh, complacency is not our friend. Here we really need to think through how to have all the pieces together 
and to do as much work in anticipation of what that next pandemic is before it hits us, because it's going to. I don't know anybody who would say, oh, well, don't worry, that was the last global pandemic. We're done with those. We're not going to be that lucky. So thanks very much. I'm glad to have a chance to share those few thoughts with you and looking forward to the panels. Thank you, Dr. Collins. That was a, a fantastic opening and, and closing to our keynote. And it really hits home, I think, the, the point you make around collaboration and that we essentially dropped everything else and were able to come around to this unifying problem and really work together. And, and I think we need to somehow not forget that as we move forward and hopefully put this pandemic in the rear view mirror. So thank you again for, for making that point. So with that, we are right on time to move into our first panel, which will be on research scoping and prioritization. Uh, as introduced by Dr. Collins, we will be uh, uh, welcoming our moderators for this panel, Dr. Stacy Adam, who is from the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, and Dr. Michael Santos, also from the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. Both were actively involved in the active partnership that we just heard about, um, and will be walking us through sort of the lessons learned around how you set a research agenda and um, prioritize on an ongoing basis some of the, the activities that Dr. Collins also just mentioned. So I will jump off camera and turn it over to both of you. Thank you all. Great. Thanks so much, Kevin. So hello, everyone. I'm Mike Santos. My colleague Stacey Adam and I work at the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health and had the great opportunity uh, to facilitate the research scoping and prioritization working group of this initiative. Before we begin with the panel discussion, I'll give a very brief overview of the results from the working group. So the working group was focused on how the clinical evaluation of COVID therapeutics was organized. For example, how the different disease stages were considered and how candidate treatments were prioritized for clinical evaluation. It also covered how trials were designed such as efforts to develop master protocols, align on endpoints, and plan platform trials. We also considered the communication and coordination across the many groups with a stake in this endeavor. If you haven't already, you can read more about the context and the process for the working group in the meeting pre-read. Uh, and so next, I'll briefly summarize our main findings. So one key cross-cutting message was the importance of preparation which is something that uh, Janet and Francis both, both touched on in their opening comments as well. So the groundwork for a response to a public health emergency has to be laid ahead of time. The research response will begin immediately, whether or not structured scoping and prioritization has taken place. So the earlier those functions are ready, the more effectively they will be able to coordinate an efficient and effective collective research response. Uh, so this slide, if I could have up the recommendation slide, please, uh, shows the main recommendations from the working group. So the first is the importance of learning about the pathogen and the disease as quickly as possible and sharing that information so that it informs research plans. The second is to foster the creation of actionable evidence by the clinical trial ecosystem. So that is ensuring that studies have the best designs for answering key questions about therapeutics. And that's another topic that you heard both Janet and Francis really emphasize the, um, the challenges that have been experienced so far and the importance of being able to address those prospectively for future public health emergencies. The third recommendation is to enable sharing of research strategies and plans. Uh, and I think something we experienced in this emergency is that coordination depends on knowing plans, not just announced activities. And the speed of the response uh, demands that you have to be able to talk about what you're thinking about, not just what you're doing. The final recommendation again emphasizes the importance of timely information to inform research, feeding back data from trials and other studies as quickly as possible to inform plans going forward. There's more detail on each of these recommendations in the pre-read document, but right now we're delighted to have a great panel assembled to share their perspectives on the lessons learned and recommendations going forward. I'll hand the session over to Stacy to introduce them and get the conversation started. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yes, it's my pleasure today to be able to introduce our four panelists for this first session. The first being Dr. Janet Woodcock, the acting commissioner of the US FDA. 
uh, Phyllis Arthur, the Vice President of Infectious Disease and Emerging Science Policy from BIO. Dr. Elliot Levy, who has been working with the COVID R&D Consortium and is helping to lead the new Intrepid effort. And Dr. Sarah Reed, who is the Deputy Director of the Division of AIDS at the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease and was the co-chair for the Active Clinical Therapeutics Working Group. So with that, um, short introduction, because I want to leave a lot of time for discussion with our panel. We are going to just jump right in. Um, I am going to take moderator's prerogative to sort of get us kicked off and, and move forward. Um, I'm going to start with a question that I'm going to address first, both to uh, Sarah and Elliot. And Sarah, I'll have you go first and Elliot will have you go second. But um, would like you guys to briefly describe kind of the efforts that you were involved with, how um, did or does, you know, research scoping and prioritization really happen uh, for those COVID therapeutics? How, what was the process that both groups took to kind of get to the place where you were able to get uh, agents into trials? Sure, happy to start. Thank you, Stacey. And thank you, Mike and Stacey, for inviting me to participate in this panel and also for your leadership in this exercise of identifying uh, lessons learned, learned um, in research scoping and prioritization. Um, as Dr. Collins described earlier, um, one of the uh, four working groups of the active um, public-private partnership was the clinical therapeutics working group, and we had two main uh, mandates, which were to uh, prioritize agents to go into master protocols and to design those master protocols. And I'll start by just saying that we had a phenomenal group of participants in our working group uh, who worked uh, day and night, literally, to get us started and continue to uh, to this day to make sure that the uh, trials that we've designed are continue to be implemented. Um, but it really was a, an amazing group effort that included not only the um, original uh, uh, participants that you saw in the leadership group of ACTIVE, but many additional partners that we brought in along the way, including a number of uh, academic investigators as well. So just to briefly describe the agent prioritization activities, um, as Janet mentioned, we really learned as we were doing it. We were um, really under tremendous time pressure, uh, rightly so, to get um, to get to answers. So um, we made decisions uh, for better or for worse and acted on them and then acted iteratively to refine them as we kept going. But initially we came up with what we thought were some key sets of um, triage criteria as well as scoring criteria. And that's how we systematically were able to evaluate hundreds of agents, um, as Dr. Collins mentioned, that we were able to um, access early on. And as he mentioned, really what we were starting with was looking at repurposed agents. We didn't have um, you know, a number of novel antivirals we could pull off the shelf. So we look, took what was publicly available about hundreds of potential candidates and then had to systematically apply these criteria that we came up with. And we did that, um, as I mentioned, iteratively um, through several waves. And as we um, progressed, we not only refined our criteria, but we also learned more about COVID and were able to apply what we learned about the pathogenesis of the disease to our process. We brought in additional expertise as we felt it was needed. We came up with additional sets of criteria for specific types of interventions. For example, for the um, broadly neutralizing antibodies, uh, we came up with a different set of criteria that were more a minimum set of criteria that had to be met as opposed to criteria on which we would prioritize. Um, and we had uh, an additional set of criteria more recently that we've um, put together to um, look at repurposed agents that uh, could be used in, in a remote uh, designed trial. So it really has been an ongoing process um, that has been uh, refined as we go along and as we learn more and as we identify additional needs. And then on the master protocol side, so this is going on in parallel, but in communication uh, with the agent prioritization group, we started out um, with the idea that we were going to design a master protocol for evaluating agents that got prioritized and through making a set of strategic decisions um, quickly came to the conclusion that one master protocol, although it might have been possible to design, really wasn't going to be the most efficient way to answer all the questions we wanted to ask about um, treating COVID. So we initially um, discussed where in the um, 
sort of spectrum of disease we thought it would be most important to intervene and started by saying that would be with hospitalized participants and that's where we des how we designed our first protocol focused on that patient population but we knew right from the beginning that that was not going to be the only question to be asked we wanted to also look at those um, patients who had mild disease and were not yet hospitalized we wanted to look at the other end of the spectrum of participants who are very sick and uh, in the ICU. And so we um, d developed a number of master protocols to um, focus on those different patient populations. And then we also um, designed different types of master protocols um, to look at different types of interventions, whether it was um, looking at um, immunomodulatory agents as uh, was our first um, set of repurposed agents that got prioritized or more specifically to broadly neutralizing antibodies and um, also repurposed antiviral agents. And then more recently, we've been looking at agents uh, specifically for those with end organ um, failure um, in ARDS in the ICU. So we made a set of these strategic decisions about what types of master protocols would be needed. Um, and in addition from there, we made strategic decisions about the types of design issues we wanted uh, to address. And as Janet mentioned, really critical um, and overarching philosophy, I'd say to all the master protocols is that we wanted to have the resulting data be clinically actionable results. So we wanted to design rigorous clinical trials um, that would ultimately, if uh, successful, if the um, agents were proved to be efficacious, could result in an EUA. So that was a, an overarching principle. and. To get there, we made a series of additional decisions, such as that we wanted a placebo control for each of the trials. And these were really just critical decisions that we made along the way. And we can debate whether they were the right ones or not, but that, those were our guiding principles. Um, we made some more detailed decisions that we were going to compare each agent against the control and not against each other, and so on and so forth. And again, we've um, iterated on those decisions as we've gone forward. Of course, now we have effective therapies in the outpatient setting, for example, and so we've pivoted to a non-inferiority type design where we have an active control. Um, but those are the types of decisions that we um, were faced with and made along the way in developing this master protocol. And so I'll say that um, in summary that we have taken the time, I, I, I agree that it's really important um, to reflect back on lessons learned thus far. And um, within each of these work streams, the agent prioritization and the master protocols, we have taken time to um, document our um, processes and our decisions. And those are now available uh, in, um, I believe they're both online available in critical care medicine, the agent prioritization um, deliberations and then the master protocol processes and annals of internal medicine. And I think it, I, I hope that it will be helpful um, in, in the situation where we would have future pandemics, but at the very least to look at the questions that we had to ask ourselves so that we weren't asking them as we went. You know, ideally you would know the think types of considerations that you would have to make up front. You have a roadmap, so to speak, even if there might be some um, you know, nuances to the, the situation. Um, but I, I guess I'll stop there and say that, that, um, that that's our, those were our sort of overarching approaches to agent prioritization and master protocol design. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Elliot, do you want to add on to that to tell how COVID R&D maybe did it a little bit different or lessons that you all learned? Well, I think we were, we did it uh, more like than different, but um, I'll just maybe take a moment for those who don't know to describe the COVID R&D Alliance, which launched in March of 2020 under the leadership of the heads of R&D at Takeda and, and Bristol. It uh, self-assembled. Uh, ultimately, there were over 20 members, including most of the largest pharmaceutical companies, uh, small biotech consultancies, um, uh, venture and uh, and communications firms, and uh, the the you know the the alliance had three principal uh, R and D activities. It ran a screening platform for uh, compounds that were in industry refrigerators, and ultimately screened over three thousand uh, of these compounds and identified a number that uh, were identified for progression. Um, it uh, it launched a a real world data stream where the companies pooled their data resources and analytic resources to develop uh, standards and methods that were used to rapidly develop uh, essentially information on incidents, uh, uh, 
clinical presentation, clinical course and outcomes uh, in COVID-19. And then the, what we're, I think, most interested in today was the clinical therapeutics work stream. And, you know, we had the same challenge to identify um, uh, high priority compounds. I think we, we started off with a much smaller pool than, than Active did. We focused only on uh, those agents that were manufactured by companies that um, were in the alliance. So, and, and, and each company uh, conducted its own internal prioritization. So we started off with a list of about 30 candidates rather than over 500. Um, but ultimately we prioritized them in very much the same way Active did. In fact, I think Active should be commended for developing uh, quite rigorous um, procedures for screening. We used essentially the same scientific criteria uh, based, based on mechanism of action and uh, available preclinical and clinical data, safety database, um, uh, the, the PK and metabolism of the drugs, and uh, and then uh, uh, factors which would determine their ultimate value of the uh, of the medicine, including uh, the, its availability at scale and uh, ease of manufacturing. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we we went through the same process. Um, like Active, we uh, supported the launch of uh, platform trials where. Uh, our agents could be tested, and we launched what I think is, uh, to my knowledge, is the first industry uh, multi-company platform trial where uh, ultimately three of our highest priori priority agents were tested, uh, one of them uh, uh, determined to be futile, which again is a value. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm not going to say more because I think they'll, uh, we should leave time for questions, but uh, I, I just want to reiterate that uh, we uh, I think we're in violent agreement with the active group on, on, on how we can best identify these agents. Uh, it's the pragmatics of sifting through large numbers of candidates that, uh, you know, that, that pose perhaps the greatest challenge. Thanks, Elliot. And yeah, we'll definitely get back around to doing uh, some, some further questions on that. Want to take the chance to pull both uh, Janet and Phyllis in, into the discussion now. Um, Janet, I know in your intro, you talked a little bit about challenges, you know, small trials and things that we face there. I was wondering if you might want to just um, deep dive on that a bit more about, you know, you know, when did we start seeing these? How did we attempt to start addressing um, that sort of thing and, and really what you saw around um, just the sheer balloon of, of trials ongoing? Well, you know, everyone leaped into the fray uh, and tried to help, I think, when uh, COVID started spreading around the world. And so um, investigators, and in, it seemed like every medical center and other places started their own series or started to do a small trial or uh, joined up with other people. And of course, these were all repurposed agents. And we did a survey, Kevin and I commissioned this, and uh, now it's uh, held, I think, by NCATS, this information like of all the registered trials around the world in the United States. And basically what we found is fewer than, say, like a astonishing percentage, maybe fewer than 5% or 5% or fewer of the actual trials were adequately designed and powered to yield actionable information. And so, and many of them were duplicative as already been said by Francis, they studied the same thing over and over, but in too small of trial to actually yield information. And the same thing happened with the convalescent plasma trials. And these were agents that were fairly easy to obtain. Um, and so um, when, um, when larger trials started to be, get run, um, patients had been sucked up and, and, and clinical uh, research staff had been sucked up by these other trials that were ongoing. All well, this was true around the world and true in the United States as well. And Stacey, I wanted to say one other thing about what's been said already, if I may, what Sarah was talking about. You know, one of the problems with sort of not this master control, you know, at the top sort of thing was, um, Active was looking at agents and they were promising agents, but then of course Barda was working on can they get manufactured and you know Stacy how much you struggle to help companies get to the point where they could even make clinical supplies that would be adequate and make a placebo right and these are the 
things that aren't really talked about, but you have to have a placebo if you're going to do a placebo controlled trial, right? And somebody has to make the placebo and, you know, it can't be, take six months to do it. And so BARDA um, was doing some of the um, clearing the way, trying to get the supplies, but they had their own prioritization process and the contract mechanisms that they used and so forth to do those things. And that was kind of different than what active was doing in some ways. And so in the future, I would hope we'd have a, a very unified, you know, we all tried to unify that as much as we could, but there were tremendous struggles that we haven't talked about around the placebos, around the clinical supplies and Stacy, at least, because I worked with Stacy on this, I don't know about the um, vaccine side, but Stacy was just a hero in all of this uh, and very patient. Um, but we had lots of candidates that people wanted to put forward that simply couldn't be tested. They didn't even have enough supplies to test it in a large scale clinical trial, much less than be able to provide it to the population were it useful. So these were other considerate practical considerations that we had that we struggled with the entire time. Yeah, and actually, I think that's a very nice segue into what I was going to was going to ask Phyllis. So Phyllis, obviously, you know, bio oversees kind of smaller contingent companies. And you just heard Janet sort of articulate some of the challenges that were faced. I was wondering, could you elaborate a bit on that? No, it's, it's wonderful, actually, to have Janet Woodcock actually say what I was thinking in my head. I feel like I'm in great company. Um, I think that, in essence, that's what we saw as well. When I look at the recommendations we're going to discuss, a lot of them capture the frustration of small and mid-sized companies. So what you saw in those first couple of months, once we had the sequence and people started to understand the natural history, was hundreds of companies of all sizes investigating the products they had in pipeline regardless of what phase they were in, for their ability to help solve something along the continuum of treating or preventing COVID-19. And, and in the therapeutic space, I think because the topic was so broad, like in the vaccine space, relatively straightforward. Can you prevent severe disease and hopefully transmission with a vaccine? In the therapeutic space where you're trying to do early stage disease, mid-stage disease, late stage, you know, I think there were a lot of companies that were very interested in bringing products forward that had what I'll call biologic plausibility, but they didn't fit into what I thought were the very clear strategic goals that Janet and Monsef laid out about Operation War Speed was, what can I have right now, right? And I think that companies understood that there was a need to quickly operationalize around products that were near-term, late stage, manufacturing is already clear, maybe they were already existing or they were in late stage, and they could help us right this minute. The where we where we I think had a hard time figuring out how to plug in was those companies with things that could be breakthrough in in the treatment continuum. And where did those products go? Did they go to BARDA? Did they go to DOD? Did they come to active? And how did they get assessed? And I remember very early on in the pandemic, we as bio proposed, can you, and I think this is in essence what 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 uh, Active did, can you put things in categories and then look across those companies and say, let's take five or six of these and six or seven of these and seven or eight of these, knowing that the patient pool is finite, right? And that the also the ability of those taking care of those patients is finite to do clinical trial versus take care of patients. Was there a way that we could, using a structure like Active, in particular, better sequence more products in the same bucket in, let's say, treatment of ARDS, for example, versus treatment of, you know, the, the, the overstimulated immune system, or what were the different things we were trying to work on? Smaller companies would have been happy to be part of the protocol itself, as opposed to doing their own small trials that weren't very effective, but they couldn't quite figure out how to get in. Um, and I think that as they learned how to get in, you know, as we started to have active form, to some degree, I think it was more about understanding what were, as we were learning more about the disease, what were the things they needed to pivot on if they were going to be considered. And that's why a lot of times in these conversations in the working groups, I focused a lot on the communications to industry because I think companies are happy to shift to where the new need is as we learn the natural history but they weren't always sure if they were behind or in front of the data. 
And, and I, I think active is something we have championed as something that needs to stay for the precise reason that instead of building it every time we have a new disease, let's have something that everybody knows they plug into. All the government agencies are at that table and smalls can, small and mid and large companies can come with products that are in an early st in different stages of development. And there can be a plan for late stage development versus early stage potential breakthrough kinds of technologies that could be helpful in an emergency. Uh, and Phyllis, I'm going to stay with you just for a minute. Um, I know one of the things within the discussion of the work group that we had sort of identified as a gap, and you've just sort of articulated it, was we had preclinical. We had like a prioritization process for to help people in the preclinical stage, and then we had phase two and phase three trials. So we really had kind of that middle gap. But I guess talk a little bit about how much you think we could have brought some of those um, smaller companies in if we could have somehow plugged the gap between preclinical and, you know, the later phase trials. This is a perfect example, Stacey. I think there were companies that already had their preclin done and were maybe in maybe in phase one. They had a really good story to tell. They could not find a place to go that wasn't early stage money or later stage money. And I think that applying that same fantastic way that Operation War Speed worked with companies on the vaccine side to to some degree collapse one, two, and three, phase one, two, and three probably could have gotten some of these products over the hump of a relatively well-crafted but not huge placebo-controlled phase one study and into the two, three category where they could have really shown that they either mattered or they didn't matter. And companies got trapped in that extra valley of death of phase one to 2A. And, and, and I think that that is a place where we need to look across the whole ecosystem and realize that it's, it's, it's kind of a hole for medical countermeasures. Um, it, you know, you're, there's not really a place to do that that clearly owns that space between, you know, the that 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 zero and two. <laughs> and, and I think that's one of the things. If we can strengthen that, I think you'll find a lot of companies will happily come with early clinical data in humans. They need that bolster to get them over into the more critical two A two B category. Yeah, definitely. And I just want to expand out kind of on that. That was one of the gaps, obviously, that we talked about in working group. But um, for the rest of the panelists, and I won't necessarily key in who goes first, but the question that I would have for you is, you know, what would be your top recommendation of the gap that we saw that we could address for the next pandemic? And happy to have anybody jump in and have you guys kind of, you know, speak amongst each other uh, to kind of build on that. But would anybody like to start? Well, I think perhaps a fallacy, and I understand why that was the case, but is that vaccines were going to fix everything. <laughs> okay. And we have to be pretty uh, sort of uh, cold about this and realize that that might happen and that would be great in any given pandemic, but it's unlikely, especially for a respiratory virus, right? And um, so, uh, so the, having uh, a better pipeline of therapeutics and a more robust effort uh, on a variety of agents, some of them early, -er, uh, would have been good because if the thought was sort of, well, we'll get these and they'll just be as uh, the bridge to the vaccine and then everything's gonna be fine, <laughs> right? And here we are uh, a year later than, than the vaccines were thought to perhaps have appeared and we're still in the midst of this for a variety of reasons and we will be for some time. So I think um, I was uncomfortable, frankly, with, I think the short-term view is important and good to have for one group of candidates, but had we had more money, um, a longer term pipeline and a broader view would have been um, desirable, yeah. I can't reinforce that enough. I think that strategically, I think that at the strategy level, we forgot that we were always going to be treating patients for COVID and that there was no reason why we couldn't continue to have funding for innovation in the therapeutic space across all the different parts of the disease. And that much of that would help us with other respiratory illnesses as well. That there's a spillover benefit. Now the economist to me is coming out, right? There's a spillover benefit to thera broad therapeutics R&D 
that includes the recovery of people who get sick and go to the hospital, as well as earlier stage treatments. And I, I think we, we did think that the vaccines were going to be the end all be all of that. And I love vaccine. I've been in that space for 30 years, but we have to have both a treat, a treatment, a diagnostic and a vaccine strategy that is multi-pronged and multi-year with the idea that it will contribute to our overall pandemic preparedness writ large. And Elliot, maybe I can ask you to step in and how do we incentivize kind of the broader, I guess, you know, R&D, larger uh, pharma area to, to really kind of um, work towards this? I know you have some ideas. I know you guys are even probably working towards this, but would happy, be happy to hear your thoughts. Yeah, let me just, I mean, if I can say a word in response to the last question, where I, I think uh, in, in retrospect, an enormous gap was in um, antiviral research and development which uh, you know, not only did we stop working on coronavirus antivirals, but the entire field of antiviral R&D was allowed to go largely dormant um, as um, you know, the, the HIV and, and HCV came to be perceived as salt problems. Uh, and that you know, meant that there was a huge efflux of experienced medicinal chemists and, uh, and, and, and biologists out of uh, antiviral R&D and into other areas. And, and that, that uh, is, a, you know, I, I, fortunately, I think it's a challenge that we're, we're, we're addressing, but it's critically important. And the other huge gap that I'm, I'm sure everyone would agree is in, is in the availability of platform trials that can be, um, you know, that can be kept warm and then repurposed in, in, in the event of an emerging pandemic. Uh, I think we all struggle to, 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 to stand up platform trials. And, and, and while we were working at it, uh, the, the space was filled with small trials of little scientific value. Um, in terms of, of, of incentives, I, I think there is a, I would say, first of all, that, that um, there isn't a very good understanding in the industry of the potential value of investment in uh, pandemic preparedness. And, and I think there's a substantial amount of academic work that needs to be done to um, build the uh, investment thesis for the firms. I think it's there, but uh, it's either, there's, there's, you know, it's right now it's, it, it's in a sort of a precognitive state where it hasn't been expressed in terms of formal research that can be vetted. And, and, and I think that research would help us to understand whether there are additional market shaping or market enhancing mechanisms that need to be put in place in order to promote investment, including advanced purchase uh, agreements and stockpiling. Um, and then, you know, finally, I, I think that they'll, they'll, there, there needs to be a, a sort of a, an honest discussion amongst all stakeholders about pricing globally, um, which I think for, um, for innovative firms who have to be profit driven is a, is a, is a, you know, is, 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 a, is a major source of concern. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Elliot. Sarah, any thoughts yeah. on? Well, I just wanted to follow up on, I think we're hitting on recommendation number two, which is about um, ensuring that the clinical trial ecosystem will be capable of you know, producing uh, clinically actionable evidence. And, you know, Janet had spoken about this previously, but that there's, um, you know, early on in the pandemic was a, um, a desire, you know, a desire to uh, immediately jump into investigating agents, even if they were in small, poorly designed um, trials. So I think we have an opportunity now to, um, to create that blueprint that we didn't have before in, a, in the form of a, um, I don't know if it's preparedness so much as a response plan, that this will be our response in the setting of the next um, public health emergency, so that all companies and uh, investigators are aware that there will be a response, take some time to set it up. So ideally people can be part of that unified response as opposed to setting up all these um, myriad of competing uh, trials. So I think that you know all of these lessons learned, if they can be communicated more, much more broadly um, than just within the group of um, USG and, and company representatives that have already been communicating to within ourselves, um, so that people people are aware at um, academic institutions, at smaller companies, et cetera, that there will be a unified response. Um, for the next uh, uh, public health emergency. I think that'll go a long way to cutting down on the, the competing trials. 
think the, oh, I think the other recommendation I really think is important is recommendation one. Um, I think one of the hard things was we were all learning the disease all at the same time, but not all at the same time. So there was, you know, the, the, if you were, if you had good relationships with a certain thing behind a paywall, you might get more natural history data sooner than if you didn't. Um, where everyone was trying to do good solid R&D and understand how their technology might or might not apply. One of the things everyone was scrambling for was an understanding of what was happening with patients on the ground in real time. And so I think recommendation one is also extraordinarily important if you think of the entire R&D ecosystem as including industry, hospital clinicians, et cetera, having some systematic way to share information on what we were seeing with a disease that was that is not the New York Times, that is more scientific than that, I think would be extraordinarily important in having companies come with their story more online for what we're seeing and, and also facilitate, I think, a good discussion of where certain technologies or mechanisms of action might actually be the most helpful or not the most helpful. But especially when we're all learning a disease for the first time, the rapidity of sharing information with the scientific community, not the not the whole public, but the scientific in a scientific way is one of the recommendations I think could really help with much clearer response the next time. Sorry, Janet. Janet? Yeah, well, I agree with that. And I also agree with the recommendation about the research findings from clinical, which uh, were sometimes lagging. We had press releases and so forth. And, uh, uh, you know, I think some of that has been improved uh, with, you know, preprint. And so, but I really think that all, all the recommendations are important. What I wanted to talk about though, Stacy, was uh, I do think that we need a clinical trial network uh, out in the community. And the reason I believe that is that I believe we need to empower community researchers or community caregivers to do clinical research. And um, people who are in communities that aren't usually have access to research, right, are, have don't have the quality of care in some ways, because I believe access to research, say for COVID, that probably improved the quality of the care that people were getting. And so, um, and you know, it, it's not just about what we have focused on over the years is inclusion of people in clinical trials who are diverse, but I think we need diverse communities uh, engaged and, diverse investigators in rural and underserved communities and so forth. And I believe we need to do that in between having a pandemic because you can't stand something like that up in an emergency. It requires training, it requires long-term commitment and requires preservation of time for people to, uh, to, to do these types of things and participate. But I don't think we'll really have health equity in this country whatsoever if we continue to have the clinical research enterprise be a separate enterprise that's mainly carried out in specialized uh, centers. Yeah, I think uh, the groups would wholeheartedly agree with you. I think uh, the infrastructure group is gonna hit on that, I think a bit more in, in the next panel, but yeah, absolutely heard and understood. Um, I want to open up, we've been getting questions in the chat. And so I wanna make sure we at least get to a few of the audience questions. So we're not um, uh, neglecting our, our folks out there. Um, Mike, I know you've been watching this. Do you have a few queued up that you'd wanna bring forward? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks everyone for the questions you've submitted. If people continue to submit them, uh, we'll, we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Uh, so, so maybe to start off with, one of the questions was, as it's become as it's become clear how difficult it is to identify effective therapeutics, you know, how do you think about coming back to evaluate to evaluating some of the candidates that weren't prioritized initially? Um, and there's been some discussion already about uh, the persistent challenge and some of the the gaps, but um, but I guess I, I thought I would throw it open. I don't know, um, you know, Sarah, if you wanted to talk about from the active perspective, how over time, what you were looking at evolved and, and hear sure. from others, their perspectives on that. Yeah, so I think importantly, when we um, would do our waves of um, prioritization, especially in the, in the very beginning, 
um, we more often than not wouldn't discard any of the potential agents, but set them aside for the future waves. Like I said, when we first started, we really wanted agents that were ready to go into a phase three trial. So either already approved for another indication or very well along in clinical development for some other indication. Um, but we didn't, uh, you know, sort of throw things away. We put them aside uh, so that we could look at them in the future. Um, perhaps when there is more um, either preclinical data or even clinical data available for those agents. And as uh, I think was mentioned within the question, as we learned more about the disease uh, pathogenesis and became more aware of which, um, for example, uh, you know, inflammatory or uh, immune activation pathways are, more, are most relevant to the disease, we could go back and look at those agents that were targeting specific pathways. So we did um, you know, go back often to look at agents that had previously been submitted. I also didn't mention previously, but um, very helpful to our process was the development of a um, agent submission portal um, that allowed uh, investigators, companies, anyone, anyone uh, to make a submission of an agent that they wanted to be considered by the active group. And it was organized in such a way that all of the data that we were um, looking for in order to make a full assessment were requested and um, hopefully provided by the submitter. And when we went through our reviews, we would send a message back to um, the submitter if we didn't prioritize our agent as to why and what additional information they might um, be able to provide either immediately or uh, as they produced it that would help us to um, reevaluate their agent. And so there was um, a lot of ongoing dialogue with those submitters, most of whom were from companies, um, so that we could uh, go back and reevaluate agents as more data became available or as we learned more about the disease process. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, okay, so we'll maybe keep going through the questions. Uh, so one of the questions, yeah. a couple of people asked questions essentially about uh, how prioritizing host-directed therapeutics versus direct, ending, direct acting antivirals, or, or in one case, um, host acting antivirals, uh, how, how that prioritization was considered and how the current experience with emerging variants of concern might inform that uh, going forward. Janet, I, I know in your opening comments, you mentioned the initial uh, warp speed focus on antivirals. Maybe you'd like to begin, but, but certainly others to, to jump in as well. Well, you know, again, it was the matter of uh, what is the, what, it, what data are available, both preclinical and clinical, is the product available in first for clinical evaluation and then for warp speed, we were really looking at what could it be scaled, the manufacturing be scaled so it could be available within a certain amount of months. Now, there are some um, things like interferon and so forth that are currently being studied uh, in, in these trials. So I don't think anything was left off the table. It was really a matter of uh, how, of prioritization according to the criteria. So it wasn't like we said, oh, we are not going to look at host-directed um, antivirals. It was like, um, what do we have, you know, how do we rank these based on the criteria? Sarah would probably have yeah. more info about that. Yeah, I would agree with that. So we did categorize agents initially as immunomodulatory agents, antivirals, and in the antiviral category, we included host-directed antivirals. Um, uh, what we called supportive therapy, which was the, you know, anticoagulants and uh, antiplatelets and so on. And also then it, it, we just categorized broadly neutralizing antibodies on their own because we had a different set of criteria for them. Um, but nothing was off the table. And we also, as I mentioned, had different master protocols that would be uh, most suitable for each of the different intervention types based on the, the um, patient population as well as the endpoints that were um, designed in those master protocols. So we had a place for everything. It was at a certain point became a matter of what, where did we continue to have to capa the capacity to study more agents. But um, initially everything was on the table and as things rose to, um, you know, a level of, of interest based on our criteria, we did include some of each of those uh, categories in our master protocols. I think the question, Michael, is was there enough 
financial and human resources to maybe broaden the aperture for more things to be tested while not sacrificing the clinical trial size that's so important to getting actual real results. And I feel like there's a there's a space between where more resources more consistently in this space would have allowed for both the very immediate execution of the strategy that Janet talked about that's driven by Operation Warp Speed and the broader ability to continue to cycle new mechanisms of action into the categories by active. And I feel like in, in that sense, the mismatch is the funding and the human activity that absolutely did the most we could do with what we had, but had we put more money in the space, some technologies would now be over the hump that could actually be very useful to us, maybe even now or in the near term. I mean, I think it's really surprising to most people that we still don't have a small molecule antiviral, right? When we know, we know that for flu, we know, you know MABs are great. <laughs> we also know that they're not as easy. We're all trying to solve an access issue. And there are probably some solutions sitting out there. Um, there are probably some solutions for the later stage disease sitting out there, but there's maybe not enough bandwidth to fund the work for those even though there are patients that probably could benefit from those in a clinical trial. Yeah, also small molecule, if I may just inter interrupt here a little bit, Phyllis. No, that's good. You know, small molecule antivirals are notoriously difficult to speed along because they have yeah. all these like, surprises. <laughs> I think actually the American people respect that you said that because I think people want, I think the focus of all of the R&D across the scientific community has been safety ne never safety trumps advocacy right i mean we really want to make sure we're because we're giving it to hundreds of millions of americans i think we've the scientific community has tried to really put forward the idea that we're gonna if it takes more time but we know it's safer that's the right answer and i think the american people appreciate that from the entire ecosystem that's what we should be doing Thanks, everyone. So, Phyllis, maybe I'll, I'll stay with you for the next question, um, which is that from what's been discussed here, uh, it, it sounded to this audience member, like a lot of the search for possible drugs was manual or at best database searches. And so uh, the question is, what what was the role of, of chemical informatics in uh, searching and, and matching with target informatics? And I imagine in Bio's constituency, you have a, a number of companies that are are looking at um, looking at machine intelligence approaches to accelerating discovery and, and development. So, so maybe you could give your perspectives on that. Yeah, we did indeed have a lot of companies that were aggressively and actively using AI and other, you know, and other things to look at what was on the shelf and really understand its potential for activity against COVID, whether it was SARS-CoV-2 or where the things could be pan-corona. Um, I, I think that's very much an active part of this. I think the question they had was then what do I do with that? But a lot of companies, I've, I'd, say, I'd say some of the smaller companies they were just trying to find a place to test what they had on the shelf, which was obviously less of a deep bench, but potentially had a mechanism of action. I spent the beginning of the pandemic helping people find a BSL-3 lab to test their, their, their mechanism against COVID. Um, and I think as we got over that, people did try to use, you know, uh, informatics to really help them understand the potential so that when they went into the system, they had more robust data. Maybe I can just add that um, in addition to the sort of informatics that you're discussing, that there's a vast potential to use AI and machine learning to scrutinize the medical and scientific literature, um, which is, is really underexploited. Um, Baricitinib, I think, came to, uh, surfaced as a, uh, an attractive JAK inhibitor for study based on uh, work with machine learning that teased out a potential secondary antiviral mechanism of action. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's just an, an example of potential. None of us, you know, those of us who sat on the agent prioritization subcommittee for active can, can, can all attest to how difficult it is to sift through the medical literature using manual means. And uh, it's, it, I think it, that we're at a point in history where uh, the wide availability of machine learning could vastly accelerate not only the pace, but the quality of discoveries from the medical literature. Great. Thank you, Phyllis and Elliot. Uh, and Elliot, maybe we'll start with you on, on this next question and, and then also open it up. So 
there is a question about given all the candidate therapeutics to evaluate, how did you think about head-to-head -head clinical evaluation? Um, so maybe some reflections on on some of the benefits of and uh, versus challenges there. Um, Sarah, I know you mentioned previously the decision within active for the master protocols to compare explicitly to control uh, rather than to head to head. So yeah, I, I guess Elliot, Sarah, others. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, 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 I want to leave time for Sarah to respond as well, but I think at the start, until you had a proven effective therapy, you had to have a placebo comparator. Um, and uh, there was there really is no alternative. Uh, and, and I think once you have an established established uh, active agent, then you can begin to use it as a reference in future trials, which is actually how things evolve. And, and Sarah, I see you nodding your head. Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, we did make that strategic decision initially that we weren't looking for the best because we had none. So we wanted effective therapies, period. But now that um, monoclonal antibodies are the standard of care. We've had to switch our um, design to have an, that act as an active comparator. And the design has switched in a non-inferiority study for the, for the outpatient trials anyway. Um, it, it was a slightly different calculation for inpatient um, as very early on in our um, development of master protocols, remdesivir became, uh, received an EUA and later, um, not shortly thereafter approved. So that, had to be our standard of care on top of which um, we evaluated additional agents. And I think it will continue to shift as, you know, as dexamethasone and other um, baricitinib, et cetera, have become available in each case. We have to look at each design on, in a case by case to ask the question, are we looking at a comparison? Are we looking at an on top of, et cetera? Um, and in addition to that, I think that some of these agents, particularly as we mentioned for the monoclonal antibodies are still um, the accessibility is, is still an issue, Del delivery is an issue. I think we still need to look for, um, to consider um, agents that are, that are just simply easier to deliver an oral um, antiviral agent, for example, for the, in the outpatient setting, I think is, you know, still offer a great advantage. Um, and therefore I wouldn't be looking necessarily for something better than the standard of care, but I think that the non-inferiority design would still um, be relevant. And just to build on this, and I'm going to, Janet, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot on this one. Um, obviously, uh, we chose placebo control and the descriptions of what Sarah put forward. Uh, I know at least in the beginning and even still some now, we have taken a lot of um, feedback, let's call it, that maybe we should have chosen pragmatic designs and head to head as they did in the UK and recovery and things of that nature. Now, those were mostly repurposed drugs and we were testing some novel agents, but you know, what it would it take, I guess, to allow something like a pragmatic to become regulatory acceptable? Because that was part of the reason that we chose to kind of keep the designs that we did. We really wanted these to be reg intent. Um, so is there a way, you know, that we can move fast with pragmatics and yet still get the data that the regulatory bodies would need? Well, you know, I think that's going to require more conversation. To me, it, re it, it depends on the endpoint. Um, when you're talking about an endpoint that is clinical judgment and a bunch of stages and everything, then an open uh, label trial uh, is, can it can be problematic, right? Um, if you're talking about mortality, uh, it's different. If you're talking about the hospital discharge, that's a matter of judgment and, and so forth. And so it raises all these questions. If you have a home run drug like dexamethasone, it really doesn't matter. I mean, you have such a large treatment effect, right? That people aren't going to, but here um, often we haven't been looking. Now in the outpatient, um, setting with the monoclonals, we had a very large treatment effect if you if you took high risk people and, and used those. But that would be risky because you don't know what kind of effect you're going to have. And the smaller your treatment effect, the more important I think it is to have a, a you know blinded control because uh, there's so many factors that can um, uh, lead to miss in, in a misinterpreting the results otherwise. So I, I really believe in pragmatic trials. I think they're very uh, having a very important role and I don't think they're done often enough. Um, but I think we do have to uh, think about the setting and the endpoints in particular and how subjective all this might be. Uh, so 
uh, it, it really does continue to require conversation. I think it would be really good if we could do more pragmatic trials um, to, um, in, the, in this is outside of this discussion, but if we had a trial network and did a lot of trials on what works best and what should treatment policy be in a given disease and so forth and so on. Those are basically comparing one regimen or one treatment policy to another. Those are the kind of trials that you really um, could get used to having um, no placebo group per se. Great, thanks Janet. And actually may, maybe we'll stay with you to start on this next question. So during a public health emergency, what should be incorporated into trials for other indications, for example, oncology trials? Um, so I guess maybe there are a couple of questions there about what can be learned from trials for other indications. Also, maybe how an epidemic pathogen compromises other research objectives. Um, but but would be interested to hear yours and, of course, anybody else's perspectives on that. Well, a lot of things had to be modified during COVID so that trials, especially for life-threatening diseases, you can't just stop them so they could go on. Uh, we discovered that telehealth is actually visits, uh, 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 patient visits actually work very well in many settings. We learned that we can use different uh, monitoring, you know, remotely remote electronic devices to find out certain things. We learned that we can do, informed consent, we learned this from COVID on, on cell phones, right? And on the patient's cell phone and so forth. So I, I think a lot of those things will carry through uh, to general practice, just like uh, much more telework is probably gonna happen around the world uh, as a result of this. Um, as far as what could those trials do for, for, for COVID, I, I have less insight into that be interested in the other panelists. Does anyone want to add anything to that? Well, I think we, you know, we, we could adopt, for, particularly for outpatient trials uh, and COVID-19 and other uh, uh, pandemic agents, uh, the, the same, many of the same procedures that were used in our, our outpatient clinical trials in, in other disease areas. Um, including um, uh, remote evaluations, remote informed consent, um, uh, 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 in-house visits when nursing care is required, use of local uh, investigative facilities, local labs, local radiology, um, and the direct-to-patient shipment of investigational product. All the things that, that we, we did during the pandemic for all our other therapeutic areas, they're all, I think, potentially relevant for, uh, for, for antiviral outpatient trials as well. Yeah, well, Active 6 is using a lot of those techniques. It, it's uh, partly uh, fully remote. Of course, these are uh, repurposed drugs that have a long safety track record that they're using or well understood uh, record. They're oral agents. So it doesn't, you don't have to fuss around about a lot of things. And so they're able to do some of the enroll those patients remotely and um, assess them remotely. So yeah, that is happening. I think the key just, uh, thing, oh, sorry. Oh, ahead, sorry, sorry. I was just Go going ahead. to point out that I think early on the clinical trial capacity working group um, put together, I think they called them playbooks, um, which were sort of best practices for a lot of these remote, um, act, you know, activities that would turn remote that had once been in person. And um, they, they might touch on that in another panel. But I think that since then, each of the protocol teams have also um, developed really useful tools that we should consider um, somehow also making available, not just for future um, outpatient antiviral trials, but then for other trials that um, might be occurring in the setting of a pandemic or not. They just um, might increase efficiency and so could be become now the new way of implementing clinical trials. I think that's that's very much what I was going to say is, you know, Janet kind of talked about we need to get the trials more closer to the communities so that we can really guarantee the diversity of investigators, um, referring physicians can investigate locally um, and people can go to trials that are near them in a place to recognize. And some of these things that 
we learned doing these trials that make it easier to be in a trial actually, I think, are part and parcel of that diversity mechanism. Right. So if I'm a busy Medicaid physician and I know that my clinical trial patients can do a call with the nurse running the study and not come in my office, that might help me feel comfortable being an investigator. If I work for a living in a job where I can't take off an hour and a half, but I can pop on my phone for my check in with the clinical nurse on my lunch break. These are the things that might really help with the diversity mechanisms, just thinking about the way people have to live their lives right now. Great. Well, given the time and the content, this is a perfect opportunity for us to wrap up this panel and uh, look forward to transitioning into the subsequent panels, which are also going to talk more about infrastructure and resourcing for clinical trials and execution of clinical trials. So on behalf of, of Stacey and me, I want to thank Janet, Phyllis, Sarah, Elliot, again, for your contributions throughout the pandemic and on today's panel. Uh, and we're all looking forward to enjoying the rest of this meeting. So I think uh, with that, we'll turn it back over to uh, to you, uh, Kevin or, or Susan, whoever is up next. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Michael. And thanks to every one of those uh, panelists. I feel like we've just been given the first edition of our master class in um, thinking through this lessons learned exercise and really appreciate the investment of each of our speakers and our, and, and our panel moderators in helping us consider um, what we might change and a good path forward as it relates to research scoping and prioritization. And as you said, Michael, um, it's time then to, for everyone, just take a deep breath because we're going to head into panel two and I expect the discussion is going to be just as robust and educational. Um, for panel two, we are going to look at um, infrastructure and resourcing. And our moderators here are each from Faster Cures. Uh, Esther Krofa, who serves as the Executive Director at Faster Cures and the Center for Public Health with the Milken Institute. And her colleague, Kristen Schneeman, will be helping us uh, dig into the recommendations that are relevant in this area, as well as then react to the really excellent questions that we're getting through the Q&A and the chat. So if I may, I will ask uh, Kristen, I see you're coming up on camera and Esther, you're coming up. I'm going to step out of the way and allow you and your panel to take over the platform. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, really appreciate it and um, uh, glad to follow on that excellent first session. Um, it did very much uh, touch on some of the issues we'll touch on in this session as well. Um, and uh, um, uh, so, so let's uh, get going. Um, uh, so my name is Kristen Schneeman. I'm a director at Faster Cures, which is a center of the Milken Institute. Um, we were responsible as part of this uh, overall effort for leading the working group focused on the infrastructure and resourcing needed for effective clinical evaluation of therapeutics, uh, specifically within the context of the current public health emergency and future ones. Um, but we believe these lessons learned uh, very much apply to our ability to effectively evaluate therapeutics outside the context of a public health emergency as well, which is why we were eager to be involved in this effort. Um, I'm uh, here just to give a high level overview of our working group's recommendations, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Esther Krofa, Faster Cures Executive Director, to lead the discussion with our distinguished panelists, um, several of whom were active participants in our working group. Um, and if you wanna go ahead and uh, bring up the slide with the recommendations on it. Um, so our first recommendation, um, uh, we had five, uh, centers on the importance of identifying and leveraging existing clinical trial infrastructure and public-private partnerships and deploying them against high priority unmet needs between public health emergencies. And you've already heard some discussion of that. Uh, some of these networks and partnerships like Active, like CoVPN, were built on the foundation of existing infrastructure and initiatives uh, and proved quite effective during COVID. Um, there were gaps, however, in engaging, um, maybe fully engaging, for instance, the VA's extensive network, uh, maybe federally qualified health centers in um, some of the COVID research. So there were certainly gaps that we, we should look to address. Um, developing a plan for setting and funding research challenges, so to speak, to keep this research base warm, or that term a couple of times already, uh, would help ensure it, that it's in place when another public health emergency occurs. Uh, the second recommendation uh, addresses the need to build, engage, and support more community-based institutions and networks. 
to improve the representativeness of clinical trials and our ability to deploy more pragmatic trials across the board. Uh, those of you who tuned into the previous session heard Dr. Woodcock and others emphasize the importance um, of this recommendation. Uh, we certainly saw during the pandemic the difficulty of reaching patients everywhere across the country in places beyond the reach of academic medical centers, um, and especially those in historically underserved communities who were hardest hit. Um, this recommendation is aimed at what it would take to build greater capacity and partnerships for conducting clinical research in more places, as well as promoting more pragmatic designs to enable early, uh, easier engagement by more sites. Um, and you're going to hear many of these themes in the clinical trial execution panel after this one, as there was a lot of synergy between uh, our group and that one on recommendations like this. Um, the third recommendation is focused on removing post-pandemic barriers to expanded adoption of decentralized and hybrid trials um, and remote monitoring tools. Again, something we just heard at the end of the last session. Um, we've all certainly seen the rapid transition to greater use of decentralized and remote approaches uh, to research studies and monitoring, as well as care. I think we've all personally probably benefited from that uh, over the last year and a half. Um, what might have been considered risky by sponsors and providers in the past all of a sudden became necessary risk mitigation. Um, but many of the flexibilities that were put in place for the public health emergency will not naturally persist with its end. So purposeful action has to be taken to ensure their continued use, improvement, and growth. Uh, the fourth recommendation addresses challenges with patient enrollment, particularly the need um, during a public health emergency to prioritize enrollment in well-designed trials. Again, something we heard discussed earlier, and I, I like Dr. Woodcock's um, phrase earlier that it felt like we were starving in the midst of plenty sometimes. Um, and this recommendation, as we unrolled it, sort of speaks to more effective communication strategies, embedding clinical research tools as part of routine clinical care, uh, and establishing guidelines for co-enrollment, which was challenging in this context. Um, and the fifth and final recommendation kind of returns to the need to increase participation in trials from underrepresented communities and create action plans for improvement. Uh, the previous recommendation number two was focused more on the sites, networks, partnerships, um, while this one was aimed more squarely at reaching research participants, um, there are many examples of organizations that have been successful at engaging diverse communities in research. We saw some successes during the pandemic with NIH's SEAL initiative, which we heard about from Dr. Collins, uh, and some of the vaccine trials recruiting significant numbers of racial and ethnic minority participants. So there are playbooks and success stories, um, but also many obstacles and challenges in terms of resources policies and coordination that need to be addressed. Um, and this is certainly an area of great interest and focus for Faster Cures going forward, as we know it is for many of the rest of you as well. And I'm gonna stop there and hand it over to Esther and our speakers. Well, thank you so much, Kristen, and uh, welcome to all of our panelists. And it's been a great conversation so far uh, throughout the day. And um, no doubt we'll keep up that energy with this panel as well. Many of you, of course, participated in our working group process, and so you're quite familiar with those recommendations that Kristen just outlined. Um, why don't I introduce the panel, and then we'll get going in terms of our conversation. First, Dr. Barbara Beer, Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Faculty Director and Director of the Multi-Regional Clinical Trials Center, MRCT, um, as many of us are familiar with her work. Uh, Dr. Doug Petticord, who's Executive Director of the Association of Clinical Research Organizations, ACRO, that was referenced by uh, Janet in her comments, and President of the Washington Health Strategies Group, uh, so welcome. Uh, third, Dr. Jim Bain, who serves as the Vice President and Senior Advocacy Lead for Pharma, uh, welcome to you. And then finally, Dr. Michael Carilla, who is the Director of the Division of Clinical Innovation at the National Center for Advancing Transnational Science, so NCATS, um, part of the NIH. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Uh, there's a lot for us to talk about. A lot of the themes really emerged in the earlier conversations today, both in the keynotes um, by Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Collins as well. Um, but Barbara, you know, I'd like to start with you just to offer your thoughts. We've gone down this uh, memory lane of the last 18 months or so um, of the pandemic and the response to the pandemic, and you've been also quite well situated in the midst of the response efforts uh, from your vantage points and capturing these lessons learned. So I thought you could offer your reflections over the last 18 months, um, particularly those early months um, around the challenges with infrastructure and resources, which is our topic uh, for our panel today. Um, what did you see and, and, and what are some of your observations looking back? 
So thank you so much and thank you for inviting me and thank you to Reagan Udall for arranging this really wonderful uh, day and the first session was just fantastic. Um, so if we drop back to Boston in March of 2020, where we had just had a super spreader event, let me um, remind you all that we had um, uh, deployed every hospital bed basically and every ICU bed to COVID-19 that we, we had no therapies. We had um, sort of repurposed uh, all of the resources and many of the individuals that were there to care for COVID-19. We were all um, sort of really beleaguered with the fact that we were trying to treat patients without any tools, information, even natural history. Um, and we stopped all of clinical research other than that related to COVID-19, which for issues like oncology was problematic. It um, at best. Um, and then went into a period where we, as every um, institution, basically on its own in the early days, stood up individual trials, um, which were then because there were so many people who wanted to study it, had to be prioritized based on resource constraints. And none of those trials really had the um, statistical power to be contributing uh, to generalizable knowledge. Um, now, exactly why that was, we, we will get into. But what we learned over the next several months is um, we, need, we needed and still need leadership and governance, not just at the institutional level, but at the regional level, the, the state level, and then the federal level, and then collaboration externally. And we were thankful, I think, for the many wonderful efforts at partnership that came, if anything, for us felt late, but better late than never. And um, I think that was really important. This issue of how to triage and deal in resource uh, limited settings, which we found ourselves at the Harvard Hospitals, resource limited, you know, sharing PPE kind of thing. Um, it, was part of the pandemic experience and one where we found that the more organized we were, the better it was. What became clear, however, is that we were seeing a host of uh, patients that were underserved and underrepresented in medicine um, in, in, the, in our hospitals and that we did not have either the network, uh, the infrastructure, or the collaborative, collaborative platforms to reach out to the communities in effective ways, even locally. Now, that has, I think, changed. And I think the, the, if there's any silver lining here, it's that we are ready um, and committed as a society to address many of these problems. And I think this is part of why we're here together. Um, I also think infrastructure used to be a dirty word, essentially, um, and nobody would, but it's been, it's been so critical. I mean, as, as Mike knows, we've been working on a system of, uh, of IRB review to allow reliant review. Um, and just having that in place allowed the really remarkable um, uh, collaboration across institutions such that the fastest determination of reliance was 16 minutes uh, across institutions um, where there was no need anymore because we already had it to figure out how to do it. We need to do that in every aspect of what we do. Um, and, and then on a sort of more uh, global scale in, in many ways, establish the communication pathways so that even if they're setting up uh, individual trials, the endpoints are comparable, the data definitions are comparable. We can then interoperate the, the, the sort of um, uh, individual patient level data with appropriate confidentiality and privacy provisions. Um, and, and then make sure that we communicate um, to the communities and those affected with health literate language concordant um, materials. 
um, we we learned a lot about uh, trust in the last 18 months. And I think we have a long way to go to rebuild that um, or to build it anew uh, in communities that we have sort of served poorly. So I do think this idea that we need to do a much better job of reaching out to uh, the communities and not just in a paternalistic way, but, but um, believing and acting in a way that is authentic, that the community should drive much of what we do. It's not from the academic centers to the communities, but it's figuring out how that really is a network that is a partnership. Um, we've done a lot of work at the MRCT Center on diversity, inclusion, and equity, have lots of practical recommendations, but there is nothing compared to seeing um, the kind of partnership and respect uh, that we've seen over the last uh, number of months come to bear. So I'm going to stop there and then happy to pick up on a number of themes, but I know what others are going to say. So. Yes, well, thank you for that, Barbara. Those were great opening comments and there are a number of places for us to go further in conversations there. Doug, we're talking about infrastructure and the CRO networks were being called upon um, either through industry or through the active collaborations and otherwise. Uh, to stand up trials rapidly. So maybe you can share a bit about your experience the last 18 months and what you observed and uh, what some of the challenges were. Sure, thanks. Thanks very much, Esther. And thanks so much for the, for the invitation to, to be on the panel today. Um, and I, I, I must say, I have kind of beat the drum for a really long time on the issue of how can we better take, set up, sort of public-private partnerships such that we can take advantage of existing trial networks as opposed to always trying to build a new trial network. Um, and I think the pandemic really um, certainly brought that message into, in, in, into the light. Um, quick note just on the, the, the large global CROs and the kinds of networks that they maintain. Um, so they really have two sorts of, of trial networks. One is a small set of kind of owned um, clinical research sites. And those are often, you know, phase one units, um, dedicated research sites that do phase two, three research across a variety of therapeutic areas. Um, that I would characterize as sort of the standing network. There is a small-ish but standing network that is really available to um, do new clinical trials across a variety of areas. There's a different and much, much larger clinical trial network that um, the large global CROs maintain, and, and they call them variously preferred sites or ready sites. And I think this is the, the, the set of clinical trial sites that have been through qualification, preparation, um, activation on one or more clinical trials previously. And so they can be thought of as experience sites. So they're, they're preferred sites for the CROs. And I would think of that as not so much a standing network, but a ready network. It's a network that can be in some ways put together to be purpose-built for, for a particular um, situation like the pandemic was. Um, and those sites, importantly, are warm sites. So people have talked about that phrase a lot. Um, clinical, clinical trial sites need to be kept running in between pandemics. We really can't have a sort of, a sort of dedicated pandemic um, trial network that simply isn't going to work. Um, I do think the way that those preferred sites have been developed, I think, is that historically the CROs have committed to what I would call the democratization of research. So in addition to working with academic medical centers, the CROs for a very long time have worked with community hospitals, with large and small practices, with dedicated research sites. And I think that's a piece, that democratization is 
the previous panel, I think, mentioned the issue of the need to embed research into care-based settings. Um, that, that people talk about clinical research as a care option. Um, and I think the flip side of that is it's important to put research into, into um, care-based settings. So, so this is the, the, the sort of approach that I think um, HRSA and AHRQ um, often take, which is going into, into um, community sites and placing research into those kinds of sites. So all of that is kind of background to then the sum of what worked well and what what, what worked less well. I think the I think the the partnership with a number of the active studies um, was important. I think what it illustrated was not only how difficult it can be to set up kind of new trial networks, but also then the huge number of pure project management functions that many of the large CROs you know, kind of bring to the table. So now I'm talking about things like managing a central IRB and the local ethics committee submissions, um, doing contracting, right? Management of site documentation, 1572s and the like, um, developing country and site um, informed consent forms, site monitoring, et cetera. I think those pure kind of project management functions um, were very much part of um, bringing those to bear. Um, I think, I think um, allowed for it, certainly some of the active studies um, to proceed more quickly. Um, the last thing I'll mention just in, in sort of opening comments is one of the things that um, the pandemic clearly uh, brought for us was the rapid shift toward remote and decentralized activities. So one of the things we do is a, is, is a survey every year of ongoing trials, roughly 6,000 undertaken by um, large CROs that are in our membership. And in February of 2020, um, ongoing clinical trials, 82% um, were using on-site monitoring in February, 2020. Uh, by April of 2020, in the first wave of the pandemic, there had been now 93% of trials were using offsite monitoring. If you wanna know how trials kept running, the extent to which they did, it certainly was the very rapid transition um, to offsite and remote activities. And that I think was really allowed by two things. One was by the preparation that had gone into um, sort of establishing decentral the decentralization of various kinds of um, trial functions. And the other was, a, a, was certainly regulatory flexibility from the FDA and, and, and other regulators. So I think that will be something that, that you know, we're gonna hope will continue on into the future. Um, I will say, we're doing a, a study at this point of um, uh, DCTs and um, always comes down to, you know, definitions are important, what counts as decentralized, what counts as hybrid, but it, we're looking at just certain, certain functions. So you look at everything from e-consent and e-signature to direct to and from patient shipments, um, to home health visits, to telemedicines, which are medicine, which already been mentioned, um, to ECOA and ePro and connected devices and the like. Um, I think it will be um, interesting if one of the learnings that we take from the pandemic certainly is that the move to remote and decentralized or hybrid trials um, is something that actually is really good for everybody, most especially um, trial participants. So let me stop at that point, Esther, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Well, thank you so much, Doug. And, um, you know, Barbara made the point, which is going to be a theme throughout. Um, infrastructure is, is not the sexy topic until it becomes the rate limiting factor in, in speed. And, and you certainly touched on some of those items as well. Jim, I, I want to call on you just to reflect as well um, your experience over the last 18 months uh, working with um, your companies and trying to, one, keep trials going on, and, and Doug talked about some of that, but also what the infrastructure needs were to work quite quickly 
across issues like contracting, indemnity, and IRB, all of those, um, you know, uh, bolts and, and nuts and bolts of how do you establish trials quickly, uh, maybe you can offer your reflections. Well, thank you very much, Esther, and, and I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to join this, uh, this important discussion. Uh, certainly, the experiences of the last 18 months have been extraordinary for all of us, and uh, that includes uh, those of us in the biomedical pharmaceutical industry. Um, I, I, I would like to start in that vein with acknowledgement of uh, all of the extraordinary efforts that have been made by uh, different parts, different stakeholders in the biomedical ecosystem uh, to move and move quickly with uh, the COVID vaccines and therapeutics, um, in, including, uh, not limited to by any sense, but including the clinical, the critical dialogue between and feedback between uh, uh, industry sponsors and, and regulators so that we had clear expectations um, for what evidence was uh, appropriate and what designs were most appropriate for moving forward with clinical research. Um, that was the, 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 the uh, uh, enabler of all the rest of, of, of the work that we're talking about. Um, in the context of infrastructure, I, I, I do want to also recognize, as Doug did, that it's important to, to note, um, and, and it's an ongoing challenge, the impact of the pandemic on the uh, continued progress of innovative experimental medicines that are under development. Uh, other than those that are being developed uh, as, as uh, COVID countermeasures, and, and also on the production and, uh, and supply of existing medical products. Uh, so both of those things needed to continue. They needed to continue under very difficult circumstances while uh, you know, juggling those three balls with, with, with two hands while a, a, another ball was being juggled trying to, to make um, uh, these breakthrough therapies to address the, the COVID pandemic. Um, working with, with, with shared purpose and, and urgency, uh, highly interactive discussions uh, were, were, were rapidly advanced and identified uh, innovative solutions um, uh, for these, these challenges, such as, as, as those discussions that help address the challenge of conducting regulatory inspections uh, during a pandemic, a, a very uh, critical element of, of, of infrastructure and maintaining the, the, the activity in the infrastructure. Similarly, expanded use of innovative clinical research approaches. Some have, others have touched on this, such as decentralized trial and some of the other e dash, you know, fill in your favorite tool um, uh, technologies that have been deployed um, and, and expanded in their use over the course of the, the past, uh, past year. Uh, these things collectively have allowed both those, those uh, development programs to continue and um, importantly, the flow of, of uh, uh, critical medicines to continue. So, so, so what were some of the infrastructure-based critical success factors that we've seen and that we, we learned about during the, the, the pandemic? Uh, first, uh, companies had the existing uh, platform capabilities and, and deep experience and expertise to translate this basic science that came out of the, the, the learning process into testable exploratory medicines. So, so that's a part of the infrastructure that shouldn't go overlooked. That's the, the, the basic ability to translate information knowledge into real testable molecules. Second, companies were able to deploy and redeploy key resources such as clinical resources, which have been discussed, but I wanna highlight manufacturing resources as well, because manufacturing, as we've all learned, watching the, the vaccine story, and we'll focus on, on therapeutics here, but watching the vaccine story, don't overlook that ma manufacturing. It's, it's critical to advancing uh, uh, research and it's critical to having products that are available as soon as they're uh, uh, considered um, suitable and, and either authorized or approved by regulators. Uh, third, companies collaborated effectively with each other um, at, and at ways and at a level that we had never seen before um, and with regulators really to understand how to best study and, and advance these new treatments. Uh, we heard reference earlier to the COVID R&D Alliance that was certainly central uh, to those efforts, but, but by, was by no means the only um, effort in that regard. So, so really uh, uh, sort of new new definitions of what the, uh, uh, the, the, the ability to share and, and, and partner um, within and across industry uh, was identified. And then finally, companies were able to anticipate and front load activities that are typically done in sequence. 
this was another part of the secret sauce that that did allow and continues to allow um, these development programs to advance extremely rapidly. Uh, and, and that's things such as uh, front loading the uh, the development of uh, manufacturing process and, and, and controls and scale up. Um, these things being done at a time in the, in the development cycle where um, uh, under typical uh, situation that they, they would they would not. Um, and that 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 front loading that parallel processing was I think a, a, an immensely important part of, of the um, uh, ability to move rapidly, but also carries with it uncertainty and, and business risk that, that I think we can address through these types of discussions. So I'd like to close by noting that this uh, pandemic response experience over the 18 last 18 months so far, because we're not entirely out of these woods yet, demonstrates that, that biomedical innovation um, can be done with a thoughtful balance of purpose, caution, and urgency, uh, resulting in outcomes that are a benefit to all of us, patients and society alike. Um, and learning from these experiences, there, then it seems reasonable that similar approaches could be applied to other urgent medical needs. And, 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 and learning from these, we can broaden our, our application of these, these tools and these learnings beyond uh, pandemic preparedness, beyond being ready for the next, uh, uh, for the next uh, uh, global pandemic. So I'll stop there uh, and, and hope these comments were, were, were of interest. Yes, absolutely, Jeb. And we'll come back and talk about what does it mean to keep things warm and ready? That's certainly a theme that's come up and what's the infrastructure that we need in order to sustain networks in between these public health um, crises, but they're also applicable for other disease conditions as well. Dr. Curl, I want to bring you into the conversation and we've um, certainly heard a lot today around the role of the NIH networks, whether with SEAL uh, being leveraged for the active trials. Maybe you can take us behind the scenes uh, 18 months ago when all of that was being identified and stood up and you went through this exercise of creating an inventory of NIH assets. What was that like? What did that mean? And how are you maintaining that? Yes, yeah, so th thank you, Esther. Uh, yes, it was a, a rather uh, novel experience to say, to say the least. I think when, uh, when, when I was tapped to, to take on the active clinical trial capacity working group uh, and try to assemble uh, the clinical trial network capacities that we had and the capabilities, I think it became abundantly clear early on that no single clinical trial network was going to be able to address what we were envisioning was going to be needed. Um, and, and I think the, the first thing that that required was an inventory. And what became obvious in that working group was that no single entity, either NIH or the pharmaceutical industry or a lot of other uh, entities that were involved, uh, everyone had something to contribute. And it was really a matter of coming together and trying to put everything on a, on a, on a, on a, on a standard scale, uh, recognizing that networks are generally designed they're rather bespoke in terms of how they're constructed. They're usually put together to do something relatively specific. And so uh, one of the first things we had to do was survey across everything that everyone would make us aware of to, find, to be able to put what everybody's capabilities and capacities and, and interests to a certain extent, recognizing that while we were trying to stand up some rather large trials, there was a lot of other activity going on, both within academic centers feeling the need to do something, as well as the pharmaceutical industry wanting to move as quickly as possible in terms of what they thought might be contributory. And so uh, that, that was sort of the first effort. And it was, it was quite successful in being, being able to bring together very large assets under one single a database, an inventory of what we had available that was that was utilized by a wide array of, of, of clinical protocols that were eventually eventually developed. I think some of the other things that became unique, it was mentioned in the earlier panel that we put together a series of playbooks recognizing that things were not going to be able to work as, as normal or typical under this environment because of, as has been mentioned by other panel members, the remote requirements and an expectation that every site was going to figure it out on their own was not going to be very tenable over the long term. And so we needed to provide as many resource capabilities and options uh, to make people aware of and disperse that as quickly as possible. 
The other thing I think that was unique in terms of, at least in the early days, was we also had major, which I don't think anyone really anticipated, major supply chain issues. And so it wasn't a matter of simply having a budget line for PPE or nasal swabs. There were many sites who said, no, we don't give us money for nasal swabs, send us the nasal swabs in order to be able to conduct the studies that you want us to do. So that was a rather unique aspect that uh, we really hadn't thought about or considered, I think. It usually has not been supply chain issues have never really been a major problem uh, uh, before. So that was another unique aspect of being able to adequately resource those trials that were being considered and to think about what was actually being asked for. Just to comment a few on the uh, some of the some of the uh, commentary I've seen in the in the in the chat, uh, we have utilized quite a bit in terms of uh, more community hospitals away from academic medical centers, having been involved in some of the largest convalescent plasma trials. Some of our best recruiting uh, sites were actually more in community hospitals. And there they require a much higher level of engagement and working with providing them with, in many cases, dedicated staff and the resources. There's also a recognition that sometimes some of the master protocols that are looking at multiple, multiple interventions, the randomization schemes and the involvement in terms of what, what has to be done as per that protocol, that just may be beyond the scope of many, many smaller and many of these smaller healthcare facilities and recognizing that while there may be a lot of very valuable scientific medical questions that can be addressed in this trial, getting to the answer as quickly as possible, as simply as possible, there's a trade-off and a balance that has to be recognized and really discussed as, as, as that protocol is, is developed. Um, I think in terms of engaging them though, I think it's something to think about uh, to really find things that we can be doing in the inter-pandemic period in the future to keep that warm base available. I think there are many scientific and medical questions that they would be a very perfect place to be able to consider using. And I think it would be very valuable in an overall public health setting to keep that going. That will require an enormous amount of resources uh, going forward. One other issue, though, that I would I would address is there was one comment about using historical controls. I think it's important to recognize that for many chronic diseases, that may be quite appropriate. But in case of an emerging infectious disease, the natural history does change over time. And so you can't just simply look at what was going on in New York City or Boston in May and April of 2020 and compare that to what we see today. So I think you have to recognize that as we, as we go forward over time, the controls actually have to, uh, the placebo arms actually have to be refreshed constantly because um, the natural history uh, will change as, as the pandemic itself and the outbreak evolves, but also as the clinical care and the standard standard of care really changes over, over time, taking all that into consideration. Mm -hmm. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, why don't we just continue with you for a moment and then we'll come back and have everyone else comment. Um, one question, uh, you know, maybe two for you to think about quickly and, and comment on quickly. One is what could these networks do in the interim when we talk about keeping these networks warm? What would that require? Um, and then secondly, what surprised you the most when you went through the clinical trial capacity and the inventory? What did you walk away with to say, you know what, I'm surprised as a country that we don't have sufficient resources in X, Y, or Z? What were the, your reactions to those two things? Uh, so I think in terms of your first question, what could we do to keep them in, uh, warm based, in, in other words? I think there's probably a tremendous amount of comparative effectiveness research that could be undertaken um, that would be very valuable, uh, that is very hard to resource at the moment. And uh, quite honestly, I don't always think that academic medical centers are the perfect place to be doing that. Uh, I think a lot of uh, strategy trials in terms of different ways to approach diseases and where there maybe isn't general consensus, that's a very obvious uh, thing to be doing in a lot of, in, in, in a wide array, diversity of healthcare setting. You talk about obviously diversity of the, of, the, of, the, of the patients coming in, but I think we also have to consider the diversity of the healthcare settings uh, in terms of uh, implementation of various types of medical practices. 
And so I think that that's something that can be um, uh, should should be considered if we actually have the adequate resourcing and funding to be able to undertake that. I think there would be a lot of valuable. Um, uh, it would be very productive to the overall public health of, of the country and the rest of the world. In terms of what I walked away from, um, I, I, I think what really struck me is there probably isn't a single agreed upon definition of what exactly a clinical trial network is uh, and uh, exactly what it's for and what it's supposed to be doing. So um, uh, that was one that was the, the, the non uniformity was one thing that struck me. I think the other aspect uh, that I really learned to appreciate looking across NIH is there's a tremendous dynamic range in terms of funding to individual institutes and centers. And that's not anything that, that I or people at NIH have anything to do with. That's a consequence of, of congressional funding. Um, and and that's, just, that's just the way it is. But recognizing that, that certain ICs, because of their size, can do things in terms of what they can provide through clinical trial networks that allow them to take on certain types of uh, unmet medical needs and address certain types of scientific and medical questions that uh, uh, other types of ICs that, that don't have that resourcing, don't have that uh, scale or that uh, critical mass can really undertake some of those equivalent types of issues and uh, uh, scientific and medical questions in their specific fields because they simply don't have the ac uh, that, that, that degree of, of resources to fall back on. Thank you so much. Uh, great points there. You know, Barbara, I know you've developed a wish list of what you would like to see differently going forward. Um, what are those items for you in keeping these networks warm? And what are the gaps, um, particularly in bringing in more of the community-based settings? And Mike talked about how they're more resource intensive. So uh, what should we do differently going forward? So great, great. And I don't think we have time for the entire list, but let me start with a few. And just to annotate Mike's uh, comments for a second, I think we, we, we need to be careful that we begin to disaggregate clinical trials when we just talk about clinical trials writ large. There are comparative effectiveness research where we're doing um, uh, sort of looking at practical, well, not practical, but uh, comparative approved medication versus the kind of innovator molecules and, and approaches that Jim was talking about. And those require a different organizational thinking, um, which is in part risk-based for the participants. So I think we should be careful that we don't try and impose um, trials that might be more risky than they should be in settings in which they uh, at least initially don't belong so or don't belong today. Um, so I, I think we should start to be pretty careful about how we talk about this. The second thing um, is I think we need to also do a much better job not only of integrating uh, um, research into care uh, but also thinking about the, the sort of operational issues, the privacy and confidentiality issues that are embedded in that, which could then do damage in terms of trust and, you know, sort of assumptions. Um, I think we, we need to figure out uh, things like how to um, assess social determinants of health as a routine matter in a way that is non-stigmatizing or discriminatory and that is respectful. We don't even have standards for that. And the standards for the NIH, SDOH are different than HRSA that you have to, you know, that FQHCs have to report. I think we've underutilized uh, and undersupported our community health centers, which a different agent, you know, agency or whatever department, um, uh, supports um, in terms of their both willingness, interest, and capacity to begin to get involved in this. And we need to think through many of the policies that where we've created um, a sort of an in infrastructure at the NIH that is not deployed 
necessarily by industry and that that infrastructure is similarly not extended to CHCs or FQHCs that are elsewhere. So I do, I do think that there's a real need for a, um, a, an overall look across uh, 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 departments and departments, I mean, federally, then we can talk about international for the kinds of things that would make a, a difference. And I, I'm loath to talk through what I think um, the kinds of questions that should be instituted for the community centers um, in terms of sort of the keep warm questions. Because I think we should start with engaging the communities themselves and seeing what they want to uh, investigate and how we can support them rather than the reverse. Um, you know, and, and there, there's much more to talk about there, but um, the one thing I will say about digital and uh, DCTs, decentralized clinical trials, um, we've had a lot of experience now, and um, I think we do have to be careful that we just don't create another have and have not, the haves that, you know, have access to smartphones and digital connectivity, and those uh, in the community, elderly, I know we're supposed to say older people, but elderly, because I'm one of them, um, you know, uh, where they need more support, more uh, uh, um, help, and, and where the, the actual technology itself it is or can be a barrier. Um, so I think we need, we, we sort of have to think through what we provide uh, and to create a research in infrastructure that is inclusive uh, from its beginning and planning through its execution and data and results and return of results. So I can keep going, but. No, those are those are great those are great points and a great list um, and and a lot of work to be done to achieve all of that. Doug, I wonder if you can comment as well because you raised this topic earlier that there's no such thing as a ready-made pandemic clinical trial network. Uh, it has to be doing other things in the meantime. And to the point that Barbara just raised, which is that um, those questions have to be developed with the community themselves. Um, what's your reaction? What are your thoughts? Yeah. So, and, and I, in terms of the, the the question about resources that Dr. Carrillo raised, which is, you know, we need to think about how how do you resource community centers um, in undertaking research. And I agree with Barbara that that one clearly needs to look at. What's that mean? What kind of research in in regard to what the community does or doesn't want to um, uh, pursue? But I would encourage us to not think to to not do the usual either or, which is either community networks, community sites can be funded federally, or community sites can be funded by industry industry sponsored trials. In fact, it seems to me that that a big piece of the keep warm kind of uh, possibility comes from having sites that can that can do a variety of kinds of research. Academic medical centers clearly pursue both federally funded and industry sponsored research. And they reap different benefits from those differing kinds of funding sources, but it allows them to have a larger resource base. And so I really would like to, to kind of make a plea for, don't make this a, an, an, an either or um, kind, of, kind of choice. I think that'll, that's, that's my big one. I think we need to, continue, I think one of the things that, that certainly the vaccine trials um, benefited from enormously, obviously the, the treatment trials somewhat less, the, the therapeutics trials somewhat less so, but was the significant collaboration between FDA and NIH. I think that was a, a, a fundamentally um, important factor 
in the work that was done. So I wanna sort of continue that if FDA and NIH can in fact um, uh, proceed together, or at least be collaborative, then I think the option of looking at both industry and foundation and federally funded uh, resources um, will be important if we really are going to develop a more community-based kind of network, which is, I think, soft and ready. I think it is, you know, ready and warm as opposed to a standing network. I mean, I think you just can't, that, that's, that's a kind of, um, that's more infrastructure that, that's very difficult to build. Um, and, and so I think we need to think about ready networks. You know, and to that point, uh, Jim, I wonder if you can talk about the role, we've talked a lot about decentralized uh, trials, hybrid trials, remote tools, um, you know, the use of technology. It was important to keep other trials ongoing while we were pivoting to COVID-19 trials. Um, but as we think about the future and the lessons learned, and certainly those studies are happening right now to understand what worked and what didn't work, even the use of those remote tools. But what is the future? I mean, as we, we are thinking about um, how do we keep these networks um, going, but how do we also bring in more diverse participation? Do you think that these offer an opportunity in that, um, not an either or, right, um, but a both and? And what do you think about the role of leveraging new tools that can allow and broaden the kinds of sites or non-sites that can participate going forward? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I think the potential is, is huge. You know, the, the, the past is bringing the patient to the clinical trial site. The future is bringing the clinical trial site to the patient. That's very clear. Um, and I think that's something that will become pervasive across the ecosystem. Uh, over time, we're clearly not there yet. And as you say, we're still sort of kicking the tires on this and, and learning what works and what doesn't. And we lack, um, uh, frankly, a, a, a sound and, and, and experienced regulatory infrastructure to do much of this in, uh, but we're learning rapidly. And, and you know, I, I, I like to paraphrase that, that working at and learning at the speed of science, I think it applies here as well. There's a a tremendous amount of, of this sort of um, digital and e-technology that is becoming part of the day-to-day -day life of the, the, the clinical trialists and the clinical trial networks in a way that it wasn't even, you know, just a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't expect the pace of that to, to decrease. Um, it was certainly uh, uh, stimulated and, and highlighted by the pandemic, but it wasn't created by the pandemic. And when the pandemic is over, it's not going to go away. So. Uh, uh, tremendous opportunity there, and, and I'm I, I really looking forward to uh, that that future where um, those those trial options and and, and trial uh, the, the definition of, of of what a trial is and what its footprint looks like is very different than it is today. And I would say even the participate uh, experience of what a trial is like, right? As they're able to engage in a variety of different ways, that experience could have spillover effects that can encourage more participation in other kinds of trials as there well. Moments, though, right. you know, trial access is more about just more about than just getting to the trial site. You know, the, 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 the trial access is not just a taxi ride. And 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 for patients, um, and we've 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 had these these focus groups, and we've heard from patients on this. Um, some of the things that are very important to them is, is, is being connected to the trial and having an interactive way to, to, to work with the trial in between um, samples or in between you know, scheduled visits. It's, it means having direct and ready access to your own data. Uh, very important. I want I want to see and know and, and understand what, what, what I'm contributing to this and what those, those data look like and how they affect the, uh, the, the broader um, interpretation. And all of these things are enabled, not, not just the access to patients, but the access for patients are, are, are all enabled by these technologies. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can keep going with my questions, but why don't we bring in the questions that are coming in uh, from the audience. Uh, Dr. Carilla, why don't we start with you? Um, there's a question here about, you know, as you expand to community sites and other quote unquote new sites, uh, what level of training and support is needed at the expansion sites? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question because that's what we found to be one of the major limitations in terms of bringing on these facilities. And in many cases, it requires some dedicated staff usually coming from a, 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 a affiliated academic medical center to really provide that at, at, at the minimum some training but typically providing some, some actual uh, warm bodies uh, conducting some of this because many of these healthcare facilities, they, they simply don't have any slack or available bandwidth to sort of add stuff on top of what they're already doing. Um, and so having, having, that, having that prior engagement with an academic center uh, from past experience that really does grease the wheels in terms of moving moving forward, knowing that there's already a, a relationship, knowing that they can rely on a, a, a larger facility to sort of back them up and provide them with additional resources should be needed, I think is absolutely essential. So having those real pre-existing relationships, it's not the kind of thing you try to develop in the middle of a pandemic, although we, 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 we do that. If you have something well established then it, it, that, that is pre-existing, it's, it's no different from having that prior engagement with the community that you're trying to recruit from, uh, that you already have some, some trusted partners, you already have the contacts, you know who to pick up the phone and call. And so, uh, you know, I think having that pre-existing relationship is, is the most important, but really providing some dedicated uh, uh, personnel and resources to really help them get 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 on get online uh, in terms of being able to implement that protocol is uh, is is absolutely critical. Yeah, absolutely. Those are great comments, and others are welcome to jump on that as well. Barbara. Yeah, I was just going to add that you know the one of the challenges and 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 the reason for needing to keep these sites warm is that um, people are working as hard as they can all the time. And then to take on additional responsibilities in terms of the trial is really uh, almost impossible to do in the con in the context of your day job. Uh, so, it, you know, if, if one expands the definition of what an investigator is, which then we have to deal with 1572s and engagement and all the rest of it, which we'll assume we can do, um, you know, we have some op options. But similarly, we need to either provide surge capacity or the kind of ancillary staff that can um, take up that slack, as it were, when there is uh, uh, an, you know, an emergency or um, keep those staff engaged in the interim. Um, but it's not something you can turn on and off, even if you could arrange for the academic centers to, to, to get involved in training. You know, and another question has come up similar to that. I mean, questions are emerging around um, pragmatic trials, and I know the next panel will talk about that as well, and how community-based settings can perhaps um, move quickly, more quickly on pragmatic trials than what we consider the gold uh, standard. Um, do you all agree in terms of how do you create simple protocol trials that can be embedded at a community setting? Any comments or reactions to that? Full agreement. I, I suspect uh, most of the panel, panelists will agree with this statement that uh, the, the ability for a new site to get up and running and particularly um, perhaps community facing um, sites and investigators that are not proximal to a large academic facility um, it, you, you really do need those, those early learning opportunities and early uh, relationship building opportunities with, with the community to, uh, to have long-term success. So, you know, starting with pragmatic trials, starting with uh, uh, trials that require less uh, infrastructure perhaps and, and are a little bit uh, uh, more straightforward in terms of the, the, the sort of the benefit risk for both the site and the patient is, uh, uh, are, 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 are great. But I don't think we should, we should sort of limit our thinking about community facing sites to only being capable of doing those types of trials, uh, but it is a good, a good starting point. So yeah, I the, the, the one thing I would add to that is I think that you know, with, with, with any interventional trials, particularly if it's, if it's for registrational purposes, 
There are regulatory questions that have to be addressed as a part of that trial. There are also scientific and medical questions that that trial hopefully will, with that intervention, will be able to answer. Uh, but, but then you also have just the practical applications of how that intervention is actually going to be used. And, and sometimes when the protocol is developed, trying to put all of those issues that everyone would like to address into a single protocol, you end up with something that's very difficult to actually execute. And I think in the event of a pandemic, as we've seen in an outbreak, you really want to do try to keep it as simple and direct as possible to answer the very critical questions that you're really trying to get at and not be comprehensive or exhaustive, exhaustive in, in the approach. So, so I second that. I, I would add um, or third that. Uh, I would add a couple of other things. One is that we need to keep the research-related data either embedded in the electronic health record um, and then that has implications for what that data should look like and how it's uh, um, you know, secured and transferred and all the rest of it. I, I don't want to underestimate the degree of distrust in the community about government access to personal data. And I think we need to think about whether there should be some protections around that. Um, I'm also sensitive to the fact that in many instances, we require a social security number, an ITIN number, which again, excludes a certain proportion of people or creates a concern from the very people we're trying to include. Um, so having a much, much more granular uh, um, understanding of what's acceptable and control over the data ensuring privacy and confidentiality and being genuine about what we can and cannot promise, I think is, is um, part of it. And then having the IT infrastructure to make this as seamless as possible, the data elements as important as possible and not ancillary to the work. Um, and, you know, sort of thinking about it uh, going forward in that way. But I agree, there's no uh, uh, either or, it's both and. Mm -hmm. Doug, I'll give you the last word before we wrap up. <laughs> well, gee, that's a that's 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 a uh, an opportunity, Esther. So I want to I actually really want to support um, the notion that new community sites are likely to need additional resources, including clinical research coordinators, trainers, and the like. So I, I agree, I think Barbara is, is spot on that um, everybody's working as hard as they can. So to ask them to do kind of a, an additional set of tasks is um, going above and beyond. And I think we need to think about how to best resource that. Um, I will say on a quick note, um, having sat on the board of CDISC for over eight years, um, one of my colleagues reminded me that I needed to talk about data standards, um, that, that the notion of collecting uh, that CDISC, I know in particular, came forward with a COVID-19 data standard um, in about six weeks time, which I think was really useful um, for those collecting data. Um, the last thing I will say is, um, I really want to stick with this, not either or, but both and. Um, I, you know, I think Barbara is makes the point that in going into communities where there are trust issues, we certainly need to be clear about what we can and can't do um, and the uses of the data. I'm not sure that in, in truth, the question around the uses of the data, the accessibility of the electronic health record and the like are significantly different between those communities and the communities of people served by academic medical centers. But I think the perception is really important. I think we need to make representations to the community that the research that we do is in their interest, whether it's federally funded or industry sponsored makes, makes very little difference. So I just want to say thanks very much for the opportunity today. It's been a, a, a great discussion. Um, I look forward to, to, to further conversations on all of this. Well, thank you so much. It's a great place for us to end. You know, Barbara, you bring up some great points as it all in terms of trust and how do we build this appropriate infrastructure and resourcing, but importantly, 
how do we keep everything um, warm in between pandemics? And uh, certainly appreciate all of your, your work in this area. There's a lot of work for us to do going forward. And we'll learn from the next panel how we can have specific tools that can get these sites up and running. So thank you so much, uh, Jim, Doug, Barbara, Dr. Carilla, really appreciate your time here today and certainly all of your efforts in um, getting us through this pandemic. Thank you, Esther. All right, over to you, Kevin. Thank you, Esther, and thank you, panel, too. That was just fantastic. And I made a, a giant note in my notebook that uh, around that question about how to keep the infrastructure warm and ready. And the note that I wrote was by engaging those communities to ask them what their key needs are and, and use that as our starting point. So again, great discussion. So with that, we'll be transitioning over to panel three, which will be discussing, as Esther just mentioned, clinical trial execution. This panel will be moderated by Mark McKellen, the uh, director of the Robert J. Margolis Professor of Business Medicine and Policy and founding director, sorry, of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University, and Sarah Sheehan, the managing associate director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy as well. So Mark and Sarah, over to you. Uh, Kevin, thanks very much. And I want to give a special thanks before I get started to the Reagan Udall Foundation. This foundation is playing a critical and unique role in helping to advance uh, regulatory science in a whole range of issues where the FDA working with other parts of government and the public can make a difference. And also a special thanks to Kevin and the U.S. government team that was able to put in all the effort to bring this together while also working hard on the uh, on the current pandemic and and um, I know a whole range of other issues and then last uh, all of those who contributed to part of the collective effort on developing these recommendations um, clinical trial execution here um, really is about um, bringing effective clinical trials to a much broader part and much more powerfully into uh, our healthcare delivery, particularly needed uh, in a pandemic. When we saw uh, a lot of unanswered questions about treatments uh, early on, by definition, you don't have any that work, and a fragmented uh, response despite best efforts by the federal government and many other agencies uh, and uh, entities to uh, to, to learn quickly uh, about what treatments can work well. And so uh, the goal here uh, is to accelerate and improve preparedness and response for future pandemics, including making those responses more equitable by creating a clinical trial and healthcare infrastructure uh, that includes a broad and more diverse range of health systems and patients. So this part of the report describes the supporting steps for that. That includes changes to regulatory and legal oversight of trials, so they're fit for purpose, improvements to data infrastructure supports to collect data at a bigger scale, tools and resources to help healthcare organizations assess readiness and help them participate in the effort, all leading to broader participation in a more coordinated, comprehensive effort to generate timely, representative, and meaningful evidence. Uh, and that applies, as we were just talking about, not just during the pandemic, but uh, keeping it warm, addressing key related questions uh, on respiratory uh, uh, um, illness uh, tech, uh, treatments and the like uh, between pandemics. Um, I think there are three keys to, um, to, to uh, looking at the specific recommendation of this report. First, they all tend to center on the concept of fit for purpose clinical trial requirements. You can maybe imagine different tiers of um, clinical trial intensity. In some cases, especially for less well understood drugs, you really need to know about rare side effects, potential mechanisms and interactions uh, with other medications, et cetera. Uh, on the other hand, in conjunction with those kinds of uh, intensive studies and in, in more typical academic trials, uh, there are a lot of cases, especially at the beginning of a pandemic, where a known drug like dexamethasone uh, that's being repurposed, we understand a lot about its safety effects profile already, and we want to simply know, does it work in this context? Uh, perhaps a simpler uh, approach could work. That was the logic behind the solidarity trial platform in England that was able to bring in participation from a very broad range uh, of community providers and generate a lot of useful and timely evidence on COVID response. Second key is that this does take some policy changes, funding that focuses on platforms, broad participation, 
validated data collection coming from routine electronic data sources, so they're non-burdensome. Uh, again, with aligned payments, particularly for providers in high social, social vulnerability index areas, areas that are treating hard to reach populations, recognizing the importance of making this a really inclusive pandemic learning healthcare system. And third, nothing short of culture change along with that trust among providers and communities, including those that have been hardly reached in previous uh, research and, and uh, treatment efforts, expectations among frontline providers that answering key urgent evidence questions is feasible uh, and can be part of their work. So I wanna to turn to Sarah Sheehan from Duke Margolis to provide a high level overview of the recommendations, and then we're gonna to go to our panel. Thanks so much, Mark. Yeah, really pleased to be here. My name is Sarah Sheehan. I'm an assistant research director at the Margolis Center and uh, pleased to walk through the five approaches to support, um, you know, overall improved clinical trial execution that we pulled from this event with the help of um, many of the esteemed panelists on our panel today and, and others that you've heard from earlier and throughout the day. Um, you know, the first recommendation and approach we see is, uh, you know, important to achieving the overall objective of meaningful participation in well-designed trials that are set up to achieve actionable results at their completion um, is really improved and more effective legal and regulatory oversight of trials conducted during public health emergencies. Um, and this part of this is, is working towards approaches that help trials and trial sites work together uh, and collaborate and avoid competing across one another for patients and resources. We heard a lot about uh, master protocols and platform trial designs that can help with this. Uh, increased collaboration across trial sites and, and trials in general. Um, the second part of this recommendation being approaches that help larger and, and a more diverse group of participants, uh, providers and participants uh, participate in pandemic trials. Um, this should help us improve the representativeness of, of clinical trial populations and ultimately help us improve the efficiency of clinical trial conduct to help us mount an effective public health response in an emergency data collection setting. Um, the second recommendation you see on the screen here is also aimed at improving efficiency in trial conduct, uh, particularly through the development of reusable tools and resources that help us assess trial site readiness. So this, as you heard a lot in the last panel, will help us uh, get and hopefully keep uh, trial sites ready to address some of the priority researchable questions uh, that can help us effectively respond to the data needs, uh, you know, during future public health emergencies and, and really in other therapeutic contexts um, where there are areas of unmet medical need. Um, the third recommendation here is, is actually aimed at helping us identify some of these priority researchable questions and matching up data needs, especially data needs for regulatory decision making with the capacity of existing trial sites and networks. Um, so developing a framework like this can allow us to conduct streamlined trials hopefully going forward that balance data collection needs, uh, both for regulatory and clinical decision-making with the data collection capacity, right? It's burdensome to carve out time during care delivery um, for data collection efforts. And we wanna make sure to decrease that burden on our clinician investigators to boost participation in clinical trials more broadly. Um, the second and, and important part of this recommendation here is really aimed at uh, community, the engagement of community trial sites um, in research efforts going forward. And uh, this is, is uh, you know, I hope our panel will talk about this, but this will you know, be done in part by matching up um, data needs again, right, with the capacity for data collection at different types of sites and may allow for different levels of data collection based on that capacity. Um, so really hoping to get further into what it takes to incorporate um, these community-based sites, which provide the most care to the most, most Americans, um, but do, do not participate frequently um, in clinical research. Um, the fourth and, and fifth recommendations here are aimed at supporting broader participation, as Mark mentioned. So this culture change effort to drive uh, participation in pandemic trials, this will be supported by improved training and resourcing, especially in these, these community health sites that were mentioned uh, in the last panel. They need more help getting going. They need more help with data collection and, and of course, um, trial conduct more broadly. Um, and you know, this will also be supported by a broader effort to embed research uh, into routine care, help more uh, frontline providers participate while they do their day job. Um, and finally, in the fifth recommendation will be key to supporting, you know, effective, efficient uh, frontline participation in, 
future public health emergency trials and in trials more broadly, um, but it really takes aim at the integration of research and care through the adoption of digital tools to simplify, automate, and standardize data collection. Janice, we hope you can help you, us talk through that today. Um, and uh, I think we had some comments in the chat about uh, appropriate reimbursement to incentivize provider participation in these trials as part of, of their day job as well. So um, hope to you know, take aim at covering this broad you know, group of recommendations um, with panel remarks in a second. Uh, I'll turn it back to Mark to introduce that panel. And thanks, thanks to everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, Sarah, thanks for that uh, very concise summary of a lot of material. We've got a great panel with us to discuss and expand on these issues. Uh, that includes Sam Brown from Intermountain Health, uh, Intermountain Medical Center at the uh, at the University of Utah, Clark Files from Wake Forest School of Medicine, where he's been uh, leading some of the iSpy COVID uh, efforts there. Uh, Monica Webb Hooper, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. A lot of interest in the uh, inclusive and expansive approaches that we're proposing here. Uh, Kate Zenley from Henry Ford Health System, uh, also involved in these uh, frontline uh, clinical trial efforts. And Janice Chung of uh, Transcelerate Biopharma. Transcelerate, uh, as you all know, has been doing a lot of work to try to expand uh, effective trial participation and reduce the cost. So we're going to start with Sam. Uh, Sam, thanks for, for taking time out of uh, what I know is a, is a pretty tough surge right now in, in Utah. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having us. And I have to say, this has been an awful pandemic in so many respects. But one way it has not been awful is the opportunity to work with so many of, of you and so many other good people like this as we try to come up with good solutions. I'm coming primarily as the, now as the as someone working. I'm, I'm the senior medical director for clinical trials at Intermountain Healthcare, which is a large and expanding uh, regional and now multi regional healthcare system. But I'm also a clinical trialist and have been for some years and I'm chair of the, of the uh, active 3B protocol for critically ill patients and, and the, the PI for the pedal network Utah center. And, and so I've, I've been thinking about it from both of these perspectives. And although I'm not here to formally uh, speak on behalf of Intermountain in these quick comments, I'll be thinking about what it's been like at Intermountain. And I think most of us remember uh, early uh, 2020. I think some of us still worry that we're still in uh, April 2020. It's just been stretched out in some kind of quantum nightmare. Uh, but we were faced at Intermountain Medical Center with the beginning of a pandemic that was coming hot and heavy, the realization that the formal trials would not be really ready to go. Active was many months off in the future and pedal we were working very nimbly to launch ORCID at pandemic timelines, but we realized in Utah that we had a movement that's now actually been litigated in criminal court, but we had a movement to make hydroxychloroquine uh, available without a doctor's prescription from a giant warehouse full of imported raw API. And uh, we felt like we could do better as a state. And so there was a moment where all of Intermountain leadership assembled around doing a pragmatic comparison of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin uh, at all of our hospitals. And we did it knowing full well that on its own, it would not have adequate power to identify a relevant effect, but we also were careful to synchronize it so that it could walk into an individual patient meta-analysis, and in fact, it has done so. And crucially, even though I think it would have been listed as one of those problem trials, uh, it allowed us to galvanize the attention of executive leadership, clinicians, and all the people who wanted to help out in a way that was incredibly important to the success across Intermountain of not only that trial, but of many trials to follow. And we, we went quickly with the first trials that looked scientifically rigorous and were available to run. And so we had a mix of pharma and pedal, and then we moved as active became mature to, to a predominantly active-based uh, platform. And as we've worked this through, it's occurred to me that you really need three core things to make this work at these hospitals that are not traditionally academic. You need stories that work for people. We've been calling it culture change, but culture is complicated, but a key part of it is the capacity of participants to understand themselves and the work they do in a new and helpful way. And you need systems that don't get in the way. And that's something where 
I think we in the community assembled here can can make some progress. And then you need relationships that nourish. And, and I think all of us, if we're not already mindful of it, need to be mindful of the fact that you can only get so far off platitudes and mega stories. There needs to be a bit of chemistry with the groups that work together. And as we've worked through within NIH, within the Active Three family that's brought together uh, pre-existing networks from both NHLBI and NAAID, we've noticed that what really has sustained us is the fact that there are these core groups that know and like each other and that have been working together. And then it's almost like the two families meeting at a wedding and figuring out the relationships together. But if you don't have that, you're not going to be able to pull things off. In terms quickly of the stories that I think we need to, to have in mind is what do good clinicians do? What do they do? Historically, we've said they treat, but I think they need to respect, treat, and learn. And that needs to be a sense, a shared story that this is what clinicians do. They respect, they treat, and they learn. We also need a story, and we've done a very good job, I think, at Intermountain of this, of understanding what do you do with experimental therapies? Do you get t-shirts and protests and uh, access without a prescription? Or do you channel them through randomized, ideally platform trials where some patients will receive a placebo. I, I'm, I'm a placebo fan, uh, and I think they can be pulled off more easily than people give them credit for. But, but some people will be making a, a, a contribution to the broader community, and the rest will be receiving access to these experimental therapies that people are interested in, in a much safer and more rigorous way than they would otherwise. I think we also need to be very attentive when we come at it from these big groups of the story of what research is for. There's a very prominent story that says research is for extracting money from sick people and putting it into pharmaceutical executive bank accounts. And if we don't have a story that's true, it needs to be a true story, but if we don't have a true story about what it means to work together as a community to find solutions that will benefit that shared community, then I think we're dead in the water. And I think the communities are gonna laugh us off and say, I don't wanna give. I don't want to be a cog in the wheel of a $100 million salary or payout to somebody. And we need to think that one through. Uh, in terms of systems that get in the way, this is where I've done a lot of, of, of work and thinking. And fundamentally, these systems are designed to take care of their patients as responsibly and safely as they can. That's their mandate. And that's what they focus on. So if we're asking them to expand that capacity, we need to be mindful of what the vulnerabilities will be and what are the risks that they're needing help to manage. Some of those risks are patient safety. They wanna make sure that the molecules that are being brought in to provide trial access to their patients are not gonna be the next thalidomide. They want some reassurance that people are carefully thinking, vetting, and prioritizing. There's a lot of stress on payrolls right now. How it, we've seen this across both at Intermountain and then working on the Active 3B side, trying to help people staff up. Payrolls are hard. And these systems that need to focus on providing the clinical care of their patients are not comfortable with large payroll expansions. So NIH has been very nimble. And I really want to take my hat off to the people working with Inactive on the NIH side at figuring out ways to have contract supplementation. There's reputational risk, there's staff morale. And we found that we got about six to 12 months out of people before they got severe pandemic burnout from working too much. There's only a small subset of the people in these systems that are willing to be the nerd workaholic who works just out of the pure passion for science. There needs to be some awareness of their work-life balance and how to achieve uh, effective trial participation without destroying it. Regulatory compliance is a big deal. And I, I, I know it, I, I don't say it to be uh, iconoclastic or rude, but the only two times I've seen my research staff cry are when a patient is inexplicably angry with them or when they've had a rough visit from a monitor. Uh, and, and I think we need to acknowledge that this, some people call it with just a little touch of cynicism, the regulatory industrial complex. I think we need to be mindful of the times when that system may be serving ends that feel at odds with the ends that the people being asked to participate in trials are encountering. Indemnification, I think we know is a big deal. People are working on it, but that's a, you're asking somebody who does 
99% clinical care delivery to carve out a little 1% with a, an unpredictable and as yet unknown risk of a spurious lawsuit. They want some understanding that that will work out okay. And then in terms of the relationships that nourish, I think, again, Petal was a, has been a core at Intermountain for a long time. Intermountain was one of the founding members of ARDSnet that then became Petal. And through Petal, there were pre-established relationships of people that liked each other and worked together well. And it was very natural to then expand it out. So there has to be some core, some sense of identity that people are tied to that makes it possible for them to then be nimble and flexible. And as we talk about these huge platform trials, I think it's going to be important to realize that people are, are at some point not going to be interested in carrying the water for somebody else. There's going to have to be some sense that different groups or different sub-networks get to be in charge of a thing, even if the overall infrastructure stays the same. And again, speaking from my own experience with the Active 3 family, that's something that's really come off quite well uh, with that sense of, of sharing and moving around. And the last thing I'll comment on is that I think we need to think very carefully about the MD-centric model that we've had for so long, these 1572s, the sense that it's all about the MD and the core investigator, and recognize that, for example, we discovered that the antimicrobial stewardship pharmacists were by far the best early entry into having investigator boots on the ground at the various hospitals that are not accustomed to doing uh, research. Hospitalists, for example, clinical hospitalists, if you can carve out a little bit of administrative time for them, can also be a helpful group. And I think fundamentally what would be most useful for the systems, managing that risk for them of making sure these are good molecules, that the payrolls can be done, that it's not going to interfere with clinical work, and then figure out what are the discrete quanta of support that are required to maintain a throughput for, say, two years. If you can walk to a system and say, we would like to provide you the infrastructure money and some capitation incentive to, you know, that's fine, that will allow you to have this quantum that's needed to maintain trials open in this location for two years. And these are the trials and they're vetted and you're welcome to have a representative on the steering committee. I think that's a much easier lift than the usual multi-emails from the CROs recruiting, or even from the network saying, here's our little protocol. How do you want to sort of integrate that together? And on that, I'll turn it back to, to Mark and the other panelists. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much for all the, for those uh, very insightful comments, uh, Sam. Now, next, I'd like to turn to, turn to Clark Files. Thanks, um, Mark. Um, Clark Files, I'm really happy to be here. Um, always a tough act to follow Sam. Um, I, I've worked with Sam over the years. I'm a, I can come at this uh, uh, with the perspective of a critical care physician here at Wake Forest and, and a clinical trialist and basic scientist, um, which has been hard to do during the pandemic, uh, taking care of people and, and running clinical trials. Um, so I, I, I really wanted to focus on, on maybe four to five concrete points. Um, that I think are tools and areas where we could improve um, uh, our clinical trials uh, execution. So the first, and, and some of these Sam has mentioned, but maybe I'll elaborate a bit. So first in um, you know, contracting, um, clinical trials contracting continues to be challenging and, and tends to be one of the uh, major hangups and slowdowns that we have um, uh, for getting uh, study medications to patients. We need a national way to standardize these, streamline them, and for teams at sites to make it really clear uh, to the lawyers what it is we're doing and what it is we're not doing. Um, let me just give one concrete example. Last week, I had a contract for a, a multi-site trial that was, that was getting delayed for a few days and spoke with my contracts team and they were going back and forth. We are a site, uh, not the primary site for a clinical trial. They were going back and forth about how they wanted us to retain rights to publish data on the 10 or 20 patients we may enroll in this trial, right? Not, not important, not an important thing and not my intention. 
Um, so little things like that um, tend to be where, where some of these processes get hung up, and I, I think we can do better. <clears throat> uh, the second, which has been uh, discussed quite a bit, is the IRB. Um, I think the, the, the movement towards the central IRB over the past four or five years has been a major improvement uh, in clinical trials activity. And I think during the pandemic, we've seen um, you know, really successes both with private uh, central IRBs and academic uh, central IRBs. Um, they need to have track record of, uh, of, um, of, of doing this kind of work, being efficient and working the sites to get them going. I think we have a number of models and examples of that during the pandemic. Another point I wanted to make, which I haven't heard uh, spoken about on, on today's uh, panel, is uh, infrastructure and support for pharmacy, um, particularly uh, in the area of inpatient clinical trials. Um, investigational pharmacy is a, is a unique um, uh, field, and I would say if you I don't know data on this, but if you look across the country with my experience uh, with operations in the iSpy trial, many sites don't have investigational pharmacy or their investigational pharmacists is very thin. Um, we need to have more attention paid to investigational pharmacy. We need to find ways of standardizing things like order sets and getting investigational drugs uh, uh, operational at sites. Um, many sites have similar electronic medical records, yet the way to operationalize uh, uh, those order sets differs and sometimes can take weeks and weeks to, to get activated. These seem like sort of low hanging fruit uh, uh, for us to, uh, to, to challenge the system here a bit. The last uh, point, which I think has been mentioned quite a bit, that I think this group should really think about is, is training the next generation, right? So, so many of the people that conducted were investigators and continue to be investigators in these clinical trials are, are frontline providers. Um, lots of people have been working hard during the pandemic. Um, it's been you know the best of time to be an ARDS researcher. There's been more ARDS in the past 20 months than, than there has been in the last 100 years. Um, but, you know, we need to realize that, that there needs to be new pathways to train clinical trialists maybe that can go out and support uh, uh, these sites. That could be through a variety of different um, training paradigms. It could be PhDs, it could be master's level, it could be MDs, it could be advanced research coordinators who've spent a lot of time at sites and have a lot of deep expertise in clinical trials execution. Um, so I think we should think about that pipeline. Um, and then the last point I'd like to make is um, many of these items we need now, uh, we, we're still in the pandemic, the pandemic's not over. Um, and I think there, there are a lot of these things that, that, that we could work on now and that, that are not long-term goals. I think we could, we could work on these issues and improve the clinical trials landscape uh, immediately. And uh, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Clark, thanks very much. I appreciate your point about making sure we're applying these learnings to the, to, to the situation we're facing uh, right now as well. Um, uh, next is uh, Monica Webb-Hooper. So good afternoon. I am delighted to be a part of this important conversation. And with such an esteemed panel, I wanna thank you for the invitation to participate and thank Dr. Collins, who I believe made the recommendation um, to include the voice of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, where I serve as deputy director. And our focus is in part on engaging populations with health disparities in clinical and behavioral research. So we know that it is possible to have and to retain sufficiently diverse participants in clinical trials. And in my pre-NIH professional life, I conducted behavioral clinical trials and translational research with largely low socioeconomic status and also racial and ethnic minority individuals. So I approach this topic of clinical trial execution from that perspective and experience also. And you know, we know that this is a long standing concern in terms of the underrepresentation of racial and ethnic minority groups into clinical trials. 
we know that the enrollment fraction of racial and ethnic minority patients in funded trials, NIH-funded, industry-sponsored funded trials for cancer therapeutics, treatments for kidney disease, many others underrepresent U.S. patients. And the reasons for underrepresentation, I would argue, that all or at least most are addressable with appropriate resources and efforts. I think one important factor that reduces inclusion that trialists have much control over, and several studies have shown this, is that the narrow inclusion exclusion criteria of RCTs may have the unintended consequence of excluding the most vulnerable participants, such as the medically underserved, those with comorbidities, or groups who experience disproportionately greater health risks and mortality. And as such, findings may have limited generalizability to these populations, and they also this also has implications for health equity. The discussion in the scientific literature about the lack of diversity in biomedical research trials is all too often one-sided. What I mean is that most of this work has focused on individual level reasons, often sort of pointing the finger at individuals. So statements such as minorities don't want to participate, or they have distrust, or they are good compliant participants. Often left out of the discussion and the data are the upstream social determinants that not only affect health, but also clinical trial diversity and inclusion. That is to say, while at first glance, these seem like it's all about individual choice. The reasons, and I would argue the solutions are not all about individual choices or decision-making. And that's why it is important to understand and bring social determinants into this conversation. And healthy people define social determinants of health as the conditions in the environments in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. Healthcare, and not just healthcare access, but access to high quality healthcare is a critical social determinant of health. These determinants also affect one's ability to participate in clinical research, even when interested in doing so. So for patients seen at oft under-resourced safety net hospitals, Options for joining clinical trials are limited to non-existent. And even among uh, racial and ethnic minority patients seen at private and university-based hospitals, there are biases that I've witnessed personally and that you can read about in the literature that prevent patients from being offered opportunities to join trials. Concerns and judgments about who might or might not be a good participant, who may or may not be compliant and who may or may not adhere to a list of often confusing instructions. For patients who speak a language other than English, materials and consent forms describing the trials are often unavailable, and staff who speak Spanish and other languages are often not on the team. These are social determinants, and the goal is for everyone to have these opportunities for participation consistently. One means to help us with this is to really think about the role of specific social determinants in clinical trial inclusion for the purpose of, of using these data to implement policies and best practices that support positive multi-level change. This is how we can improve representation and do so in sustainable ways. I think the good thing about some of these social determinants is they are modifiable. That means we have opportunities for change. The last thing I'll point out is that you know, we know this is not a new issue in terms of diversity, but I think the, the health and the other disparities highlighted and exacerbated because of COVID-19 has re-energized the attention to the inclusion or lack of inclusion of racial ethnic minority persons into clinical trials. I've never seen so many media stories on this issue. And so COVID-19 created a long needed window of opportunity to focus on improving the overall lack of diversity and inclusion in trials. And even if you look at the pandemic as an example, national data from the CDC, which indicate persistent disparities by race and ethnicity, the um, inclusion within clinical trials demonstrates the importance of having an infrastructure to support enrollment across a range of diverse backgrounds. And as I heard on the last panel, this concept of being warm and ready, I really like that. If we don't have 
in have this all in place before a public health emergency, then we're going to be playing catch up in terms of the diversity of enrollees. The same applies to any area of clinical trial conduct. If we are not ready, we will be playing catch up and we may fall short of our accrual targets. So thank you for um, allowing me to join this meeting. It's, it's important. Um, and I think the goal minimally, I would say, is to have representation in trials that match the US census, which has just been updated by the way, but the real goal is to have representation that, that matches the burden of the disease or condition. Thanks. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Monica. Really appreciate your comments. Um, next, I'd like to go to Kate Zinley. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Kate Zenley. I'm the Managing Director for the Global Health Initiative at Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, Michigan. And I think where I can provide some insight and some unique experience on is we are physically located in a city that is 80% African-American. While we are an academic institution and have been uh, participating in several clinical trials throughout the years, we don't necessarily have a clinical trial wing or building set up at Henry Ford to accommodate um, such large trials so quickly. So we had a really unique experience of enrolling a diverse population, as well as really building the infrastructure from the ground up for a clinical trial of this magnitude. So we've run two of the phase three COVID-19 vaccine trials for Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, where for Moderna, we actually were the second highest enrolling site in the country. And some recommendations that I would have or experiences that we really um, had to navigate through was certainly in terms of the tools and the systems that are needed to set up a clinical trial. So from the beginning, from site activation, you know, we were always provided regulatory material right at the beginning, months before we were going to start. However, training materials, SOPs, site access forms, site blending plans, those were really only provided to us at the very end. And we, of course, had a team where we had clinical trial coordinators and research coordinators on the team. But again, a lot of our staff um, really didn't have this background per se we were pulling from, especially given the um, staffing shortages that we've seen throughout the pandemic. So we were pulling, you know, nurses who had been in the ED, not necessarily had been working in research in this capacity. So that took us some time to get up and running. And again, the sooner we could get those materials and standardize them, um, the better. Um, secondly, in terms of the systems that we set up, we found that enrollment, especially for a public health emergency and one where we're dealing with a novel coronavirus, um, is not going to be a problem. Everyone wants to enroll. There's really not anyone who did not want to enroll in this trial. That we didn't have any problem getting enough eligible participants that were interested in enrolling. Where we did see some trouble was setting up all of the other perfunctory roles that were necessary for us to operate. So when we put out the call that we were enrolling for this trial, we then had to make sure that we were set up to field the thousands of inquiries that were coming through, the call center, um, the scheduling, um, all, of the, um, all of the data software that was ne necessary to manage um, this large influx of, of participants. And again, in order to enroll more participants, um, that's going to be an exponential math problem, essentially. Um, if you enroll a smaller number of participants, given the protocol schedule of when follow-up visits need to happen, of when safety calls need to happen, you can probably manage that pretty easily um, without having such a sophisticated software up and running of when participants need to come back within their study visit window. However, when you've enrolled thousands of people um, that can get really tricky really quickly. So you need to make sure that our that your research databases are up and running. And I know others have mentioned this in terms of um, the integration and the data sharing between um, a research study database and other medical records that already exist. A lot of the information that we are already collect that we're collecting 
was already available in other medical records um, that wasn't necessarily linked to the research study. So if there is a way to kind of integrate those two, I think that would save a lot of time um, from that perspective. In terms of digital tools, while digital tools are helpful and obviously are the wave of the future, for the population we were working with, um, there were a lot of our participants where this really was not an option, whether they did not have smartphones, um, whether they were distrusting of you know, digital tools, even from looking at the consent form, um, we found that put more participants at ease really just to have a paper copy of the consent form instead of having them sign something on, on an iPad that they weren't necessarily comfortable with, especially when they're trying to make the decision whether or not to participate. Um, beyond that, I, we found that um, a lot of the recruitment methods, especially reg um, regarding minority populations, um, it really was best to just target you know, physical outreach to these populations, work with faith-based and community-based organizations, and of course, building trust with those community partners. This obviously takes a lot of time to build. And in the wake of the public health emergency, there wasn't a lot of time on our side. So it was really important that throughout this whole process, we tapped into existing um, trusted partnerships that we've already established and also continue to engage um, with new partners. And we did a lot of you know, lunch and learns and just talked to them about um, what it meant to be part of a clinical trial. Again, working with these minority populations with a low socioeconomic status, a lot of them don't even know what a clinical trial is that they even exist, that they're available for this type of population. Um, and another thing that we did find in terms of retention of um, minority populations um, that we were enrolling was specifically regarding um, educational efforts. So really directly addressing fears and drawbacks instead of just dodging these questions and pretending that you know our modern day Monitor, monitoring or review boards have it covered at this point. So if there's one thing that's certain is that politics is alive in science more than ever now. Um, and these communities are aware of that. And there's really no way of facing that reality without having that honest dialogue. So this is to talk about the history, talk about the abuse, talk about you know the frameworks and legal codes and guidelines that have really come out of this suffering um, and what we're able to do to make them feel comfortable. Um, again, of course, marketing and targeted communication is really important for these communities as well. And really understanding that a lot of our participants receive information in different ways. So it's really important for us to figure out how these communities receive their information and to work with them. And then in terms of staffing and resources, the last point I'll make with that is when you're enrolling, um, a diverse population, it might take extra staffing and resources to keep these participants into the trial. We of course found a lot of non-compliance with such a transient population. That means we'd have to track people down and call them, remind them that they need to fill out their e-diaries and so on and so forth. And you know, so this is definitely important to bake this in to the cost structure, to the payment structure, we were hiring an entirely new team, as many people have mentioned here. Everyone is working at full capacity, so we weren't pulling from existing resources. We were hiring new staff that we were paying for out of pocket until you know reimbursements came through, um, and so that took a lot of extra time. I think that really needs to be um, focused on as a priority. That realistically, we're going to have to spend more time with data collection, data entry. Um, non-compliance to keep these people engaged in, in the trial. And once we do reach them, they want to be in the trial. And it maybe they just needed a, you know, a little bit of extra direction or they needed the reminder that they had to enter this information in. Um, but there's certainly, you know, their heart was in the right place. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to you, Mark. Thank you again very much. Uh, Kate, thank, thanks very much for, for those uh, very insightful comments. And um, next, I'm turning to uh, Janice Chang. Great, thank you, Mark. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Janice Chang, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Transcelerate. It's uh, and big thanks to Reagan Rudolph Foundation for including me and 
part of the Transari Voice to be a part of this afternoon's uh, discussions. And uh, I, I would say that it's, it's a real delight to be a part of the panel. It's definitely even a special treat to be the last panelist introduced after a, a whole afternoon of discussions. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, Transari is a non-for-profit organization. Um, and our mission really is to bring together um, not only sponsors, but really also proactively engage with stakeholders from all over the world uh, to collaborate and find ways to simplify and accelerate the way we conduct uh, research and development activities with the ultimate aim to uh, really find ways to bring those innovative medicines to patients all over the world uh, in a more efficient manner. And so, you know, our core principle as Transcellular is that we really focus since our inception in late 2012 on developing pragmatic tools and templates and processes and, and technology solutions that are that can be widely available to the public, um, the broader ecosystem for everyone to adopt and benefit from. <laughs> And as I join um, sort of this walk down memory lane and reflect on uh, what we have observed over the past 18 months since the pandemic hit, uh, I will probably say, you know, the first and foremost, we really saw um, all of us really kind of really rose to the call of action, right? We really banded together in my mind as sort of citizens of the globe. Uh, we had this unifying problem that particularly as professionals in our industry really had an obligation to do our part individually and collectively to come together and find ways to really tackle the challenges that we experienced. So I thought maybe I would start off by sharing some of the activities that um, we did as part of Transcellary, mobilize some activities in, in response to the pandemic, and then also share some of my perspective in, in some of the challenges we experienced um, as part of uh, executing some of those activities. So first and foremost, you know, as I said, we saw truly, I think even Dr. Wilcock in the beginning, her opening remarks mentioned that we really saw unparalleled degree of um, willingness to share and collaborate. I think those early weeks, almost immediately, we had across the 20 um, sponsor companies as part of our membership, we had on a weekly basis, sometimes almost multiple times a week, hundreds of leaders from all over the world coming together, um, you know, really sharing, you know, the, the evolving guidances of from different countries. And also when we think about how to, from a trial continuity perspective, you know, exchanging learnings um, and best practices, um, you know, how do we continue to uh, con get the, the treatment to the patients um, and to make sure that we maintain the trial continuity in, in different regions of the world and really kind of sharing what worked and what also what didn't work. So that was really, really encouraging to see um, in those early days. and. Uh, we also saw, um, I would say within the first few weeks, you know, multiple health authorities reaching out to us proactively as Transcelerate. And I think it's sort of, we're in a unique position because we're a non-for-profit and we are a group of 20 sponsor companies with one united voice and really an, an opportunity in those discussions to really co-learn. Um, I think that's, you know, from one particular health authority saying, how do we navigate through these challenges and disruptions that we're all experiencing. So it was really encouraging to see um, that kind of sentiment um, from multiple health authorities, not just FDA in this case, but really kind of just really banding together to try and tackle this problem. And unilaterally, we saw that can-do attitude, right? I mean, I think that we saw um, we all, what we can, what can happen. I think that, you know, when you think about the treatments and the vaccines development, what can happen when we really uh, think out of the box and the willingness to perhaps adopt different tools and methods and processes um, in times of crisis. And, uh, you know, so as Transcelerate, you know, we, we were first and foremost, one of our first activities um, was actually to pull together an inventory of many common tools and templates that I made available to Active and, and FDA so that could be potentially leveraged as part of the different trial activities. And then we're also working with COVID R&D, so, um, the organization that you guys heard from the first panel, and also then kind of work together to launch a data sharing module as part of our data salary platform. And the, there was, the, it was open access to um, not just Transar member companies, but also it was open and available to qualifying smaller biopharma companies that, so it's an opportunity to really share data in real time. 
And then we also develop true to trends salaries principle. We um, developed some tools, pragmatic tools, right? We um, made available a protocol deviation toolkit, uh, which came in pretty handy. Um, and we also uh, created a set of considerations um, when it was CSR in response to and related to COVID-19 disruptions. So again, those are just some of the, the practical tools that our member companies quickly came together and developed um, and made available for, for the broader ecosystem. And, you know, I think when I think about the future and where we are, right, I mean, the reality is the future is here. Um, we, we have an obligation not to go back and, uh, you know, out of necessity, particularly in the clinical trials execution space, we saw adoption of many, many novel, non-traditional uh, tools and especially digital technologies um, in order to maintain trial continuity, as I mentioned. And it did demonstrate that, you know, what could be achieved uh, when there's willingness to work together, including the regulators, um, and think out of the box. But when I think about, you know, those adopting those tools and non-traditional methods, um, I think it's perhaps, particularly from the learnings now, the accessibility of those tools, right? And, and the training um, for those tools, we have to make sure they're widely available to ensure that they are actually at the end of the day being utilized appropriately. And when you think about the assurance or confidence of those tools, right? The qualification or validation that's necessary of those digital technologies. Um, how do we make sure that, you know, you know, certainly I think when we when throughout the past 18 months, in those early months, there was limited guidance on how could those be tools be utilized. And, and that was really challenging. And I think that's probably something when we look forward, it's an opportunity for us to proactively put some of those um, requirements or guidances in place. And, you know, then I think about, you know, the, all the different privacy requirements when you think about data collection. And, and though they vary region, country to country, right? And it's really challenging at a global trial level, how do we ensure that those are taken into consideration proactively? And then last but not least, certainly I would say, you know, we are not sure on new technologies. Uh, we have many, many options that's out there. I do think that as we have seen the, the, from the experiences, what's really lacking is probably um, a holistic data collection um, framework and how do we kind of make sure that at the end of the day, you know, while we may be using new tools to collect and have new data sources, how are we thinking about collecting those data and integrating those data from an end-to-end -end perspective, um, you know, so that we can have a seamless, seamless um, ability to report and analyze the data at the end of the day. That's really still, I think, lacking. And I think it's very much an opportunity for us as we look forward to, to the future. And, uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, where we are, um, it's probably opportune time to really focus on clearly modernizing trial conduct, right? And how do we do things very, very differently in the future, but really focusing on the importance of fostering um, a dynamic data ecosystem, as we kind of describe it in, our, in, in the transaurary world, right? So how it's not about generating more data, we're using more, more technologies per se, but how do you really um, make sure that there's a framework so that we can have robust and harmonized way to collect the data and integrate the data so that we can optimize the data accessibility, uh, the, the data utility, and the data interoperability, um, whilst very much addressing, you know, the various um, regulations when it comes to data privacy concerns. So as I, you know, to conclude, I would just say, you know, we, we have to, we're in this together, right? As a, within Trends we often say, you know, if you wanna go fast, uh, go alone, but if you wanna go far, let's go together. And we, I think as Sam said that we're not out of this pandemic yet, whereas a, as a Clark said that, and we still have a lot of work ahead of us. And I think the goal here is, as we heard throughout this afternoon, how do we take all these lessons learned and turn them into robust action plans so that we can take a multi-pronged approach so that we can maybe not pandemic proof of, of ourselves, but we can be in a much, much more ready position when the next public health emergency hits us. Great so with job. that, I'll turn it back to you, Mark.
Uh, th thanks very much for the comments, Jean comments, Jan. I think your last comment about kind of pulling together a lot of what we discussed in the panel about the opportunities uh, coming out of this uh, pandemic experience to really move forward on modernizing trial conduct with a data ecosystem, the capacity for, for learning, conducting trials is much better integrated uh, with routine clinical care seems really important. Um, I we, we are about out of time. I was wondering if I could go through um, uh, comments from the group. Uh, we had some great questions from the audience about um, you know how to do multiple arms in a trial effectively uh, how to implement placebos Sam picking up on your comments um, finding um, ways to uh, uh, building on uh, um, the, the the comments from um, Monica about getting uh, trial participation as much more represented at least of the US population if not as in this case of the population most affected by um, the, the the disease. Just um, we appreciate any um, quick comments you have about what's most important takeaway for where we go from here. And maybe Sam, I could start with you. I think I think what we really need is a rigorous modularity. We need to be able to have fit for purpose modules that are a regulatory environment, a kind of molecule, a relevant context for it, and the staffing and support needed for it, and then have, to, to Clark's important point, have contracting and legal range around it so that you get a thing that is trial of type D, and you know what that means, and it's funded for what it needs, and you slot it into the system. So I think rigorous modularity is what we need. Back to you. Thanks, Sam. Clark? Um, I would I would really echo um, what what Sam said. Adding, um, you know, a, really a push to leverage um, what we have done in this country with um, you know electronic data records, but incorporating uh, data capture in, in a clean and pragmatic way that's useful to feed into. Um, um, uh, electronic case report forms for clinical trials. I mean, the technology is there, right? It's just we we need to we need to make it do what we want it to do. Thank you, uh, Monica. Sure. So I guess I'll offer a couple of recommendations in terms of increasing uh, representation of underrepresented groups in trials. I think. Um, one recommendation would be for clinical trialists to rethink uh, me the methodology, particularly the inclusion and exclusion criteria. There are indeed trials that necessitate the inclusions that are set uh, for safety reasons. But I think the point is that many times these criteria can have unintended consequences of excluding certain groups by design. So I think a move toward more transdiagnostic intervention trials could be an intervention, an innovation when possible. Also avoiding kind of automatic cut and pasting of inclusion exclu exclusion criteria that were used in previous studies. I think the staff um, should be trained to focus on the factors and the protocol that motivate individuals to enroll in trials. These can be found in the literature or someone can follow up with me um, if you'd like more information. Think about also ways to be as flexible as possible in terms of addressing the social determinants of health, not only transportation, which I know was mentioned earlier, but also other barriers that could reduce patient level reasons for um, patient level participation. And, and, and as you said, making it easier for patients to participate in care uh, systems too, uh, along with the uh, along with the trials and those narrow exclusion criteria, which I know people worry about because they don't want to get a heterogeneous estimate. Sort of the opposite of where we want to be, especially in a, a pandemic, and learning about learning quickly about treatments that could be relevant to uh, a wide range of uh, of people. So th thanks very much, uh, Monica, uh, Kate. Uh, yes, yeah, so just to kind of echo uh, a little bit of what Monica was saying, especially in terms of inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, we found, especially in Detroit, um, one of our largest ethnic pi um, populations here is Middle Eastern. And in some of our studies, um, we found that was not even an option for when they were filling out their pre-screening form to even be eligible for the trials. And then as we know, we saw in a lot of the phase three COVID trials, at a certain point, um, our sponsors were closing down enrollment to um, anyone 
who was not a minority. And we actually ran into trouble where um, we were told that we could not enroll one of our largest minority groups when it was only for minorities um, because they didn't have that as an option. And many Middle Eastern um, people of Middle Eastern descent, they actually select white when they fill out these forms. So just to kind of think about those nuances, it seems pretty silly to us that one of the largest minority groups was not able to be enrolled when it was only for minorities. Um, so these are just things that, again, um, you really need to go to the communities and see, of course, we have you know Hispanic and African-American, but there are other minorities too um, that maybe aren't being fully represented. Yeah, and if you're not prioritizing inclusiveness, we're really not going to get there in terms of um, exactly uh, uh, broad-based trials that give us representative evidence. Janice? Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to, I think, what Sam brought up. It's about building trust, right? And there's so many different dimensions. I mean, building trust when it comes to technology and data, you got to have robust processes and, and framework in place. But perhaps more importantly, I think what Monica and Kate have touched on, you know, trust is not, doesn't just happen. We all know that, right? It's that human interaction. And there's a lot of work to be done there. How do you build trust with the patients? How do you build trust with the clinicians within the community based site, um, sites? There's a lot of work there to be done, right? And I think that's probably to me something that we have we just got to kind of put on the top of the priority for all of us, regardless of which sector of the ecosystem we work in. All right. Well, I want to thank you all, uh, not only for some great perspectives and reminding us that, the, especially at the end of the session, of what we're really here to, to try to accomplish. We want to transform um, uh, clinical evidence development, uh, both for the next pandemic and uh, hopefully more broadly in uh, the clinical trial enterprise, and especially for taking the time out to work on all this. I know you're really busy. I mean, you're where the rubber meets the road. All of these goals and aspirations for our clinical trial system, uh, you're the ones who are out there doing it. Thanks very much for the, the thoughtful and well-organized feedback on uh, on how we can do it better and, and, and move forward from here. So uh, Kevin, I'd like to, to turn back to you. The panel went over a few minutes, but uh, I think some really good perspectives. Thanks, Mark. I'm actually going to turn it over to Susan, and she's going to move us into the public comment portion of this meeting. I will just say that that was a fantastic panel. I've been trying to summarize takeaways throughout the day so that I'll be able to share them back at the end of the day. And I could not fit them all onto the one slide uh, that I was trying to do. So, so there was a lot of takeaways, um, which I, I'll be glad to share later today. So Susan, I will turn it over to you and you'll be kicking off our public comment period. And what we'll, I think we'll do is we'll keep to the same amount of time for the public comment and I'll be just briefer in my final closing remarks. That works great. Thanks so much, Kevin, and to all of our panelists. I was thinking, um, you know, in our master class of COVID-19 lessons learned and thinking about the prioritization of therapeutics, then the resourcing and then the uh, executing with clinical trials. Um, we've certainly shared a lot of information that is relevant in learning and preparing for the next pandemic, but particularly this last panel, incredibly relevant to improving how, how we do clinical trials and the reach of our clinical trials and making sure that we have um, inclusive clinical trials. So we're now going to move to the public comment portion of the meeting. And so this is for those individuals who registered to provide public comment. Um, and I'm going to call on those registered commenters in alphabetical order by last name, and then we will open your microphone so that you can speak. We had uh, the number of folks who registered for public comment. Um, we did the math, and that requires then um, that you uh, have about 90 seconds to speak. We'll have a timer that will give you the 90 seconds. I'll give you a verbal warning, um, oral warning at 20 seconds, and then your microphone will mute at 90 seconds. Um, I'll note that neither the FDA Foundation nor the agency will respond to the public comments 
um, this is you know, really just for individuals to provide a comment, then we will go to the next uh, commenter. And I'll note, as we said at the beginning of the meeting, that um, there will not be any uh, responses or information provided uh, related to pending or potential regulatory action. So let's get to the public comment and we will test this out uh, and, and see how the system works. I'll note again, uh, I'm going to go in alphabetical order by last name. We'll give you about 10 or 15 seconds to start speaking. And if you don't respond within that time, we'll move on to the next one. It will be audio only, no um, visual, but let's prepare. So our first speaker who is registered to comment is Rachel Abu Talib. Rachel? And Rachel, I see you on the screen uh, and we've given you the ability to unmute. If you would unmute, I believe you can speak. But well, I believe you can speak and you'll be heard. Hi, um, sorry about that. Um, I just like to thank everyone. And this has been a great afternoon of a lot of learning. And um, I hope uh, I, I even get the recording of this to catch a few parts that I missed and just thank you very much. Okay, and we will go to speaker number two, uh, Edward Alera. Could you, there we go, thank you for restarting the clock. And do we have Mr. Alera pulled up in the uh, ability to unmute? Okay, uh, Mr. Allaire will not be speaking. Next on the alphabetical list is Andrew Bates. Yeah, thank you so much uh, to, the, to the group. Um, I'm uh, an acute care hospitalist. And I, I take care of uh, patients, critical, critical Ill, Ill COVID patients. Um, I was just wondering, I've read promising data uh, regarding a medication, Abiptodil acidate. I was wondering if you could, um, are you aware of any trials that it's involved in? Um, I'm, I'm struggling right now because we have patients that are unfortunately very sick. And on a daily basis, I have patients passing away with COVID on high flow nasal oxygen and well encouraging vaccination. It's, it's, I struggle with finding therapeutics that are effective, effective for them. Thank you, Dr. Bates. Uh, we'll go now to Sherna Bell. Sherna Bell, B-E-L-L. -L. Okay, we will move next to Ivory Chang. Ivory Chang. And we'll move next to Jay Conway, C-O-N-W-A-Y, Jay Conway. To Nevin Debussy, D-A-B-B-O-U-S-I, Nevin Debussy. Froke Dehan. Dehan. Okay, we will move to Gear Dizariga, D I Z E R E G A. And I apologize if I have uh, mispronounced your name. 
last name D I Z E R E G A. Okay, moving to the next, Stephen Feldman, F E L D M A N, Stephen Feldman. Dave Hone, H O N E, Dave Hone. All right, Abe Kenjale, K E N J A L E. Abe Kenjale. Yasmin Long, Yasmin Long, L-O-N-G. For those of you at the end of the alphabet, this is a little bit like when everyone is clearing out of the line ahead of you in the uh, airport queue or somewhere else where you're waiting in a line. Yasmin Long. Okay, uh, Richard Lucarelli, L-U-C-A-R-E-L-L-I, Richard Lucarelli. We'll go to the next, Sharon Ann Lynch. Sharon Ann Lynch. Zach Martinez. Zach Martinez. We'll move Estella Mata, M-A-T-A, -A, Estella Mata. We'll continue to move through Linda McGibbon. Linda McGibbon. All right, Francesco, Francesco Nochera. Francesco Nochera. I see our process improvement here that we'll be implementing, which is uh, um, asking for confirmation when folks have joined the meeting and continue want to continue to provide public comment. Uh, Ramakrishna Pitaparte. Last name P-I-D-A-P-A-R-T-I, Ramakrishna Pitaparte. We'll continue to move forward. Tuma Rama Rao, R-A-M-A-R-A-O. Cyrus Rangan. Last name R A N G A N, Cyrus Rangan. Elizabeth Rigo, last name R E E G O, Elizabeth Rigo. And next, Beatrice Setnik. Beatrice, I see you're ready to go. Oh, good afternoon. The microphone. <laughs> yes, can you hear me? Um, yes, thank you for, for taking my comment. Uh, my comment is around the uh, acquired immune, immunity through COVID infection and the need for ongoing studies, uh, given the large Tel Aviv study that has uh, given promising results on natural acquired immunity through COVID infection. Uh, this really needs to be also evaluated with some standards for individuals who have gotten uh, acquired immunity and uh, in light of the vaccinations and the mandates, uh, providing options that are scientifically data-driven uh, as this is a large concern, not only especially for um, individuals who are otherwise healthy, who may have acquired immune response and may otherwise be 
uh, having to take vaccines, which could impose adverse events. Uh, so some of the, I think, the important lessons from pandemics such as this is really to carefully also evaluate innate immunity, uh, as well as other viable treatment options, as well as uh, other sources of medications that are both, uh, whether they're currently approved or in development, uh, but the consistency also of safety data and the, the foundations of VAERS and improving structural post-marketing data so that information is more transparent uh, is very important going forward in, in these types of scenarios so that we have reliable data, post-marketing data to, to rely on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Speaker Sutnik. Uh, our next uh, registered speaker, Renzi Sutaria. Renzi Sutaria? I'm getting to the last two pre-registrants as a reminder. Uh, participating in the public comment period does require registration in advance um, to give us this list. And so we have two uh, final registrants, and then we will be turning it back to um, Dr. Bugin for the last portion of the meeting. So Cindy Thompson, Cindy Thompson, T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. All right, uh, and then our final registered public comment provider, uh, Lucy Vera Shachinga. Lucy, please go ahead. Thank you, Susan. I'm Lucy Vereshagina, Vice President of Science and Regulatory Advocacy of the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, and I'm speaking on behalf of Pharma today. Uh, first, I would like uh, to say uh, thank you and congratulations to all the speakers and panelists today, uh, great discussions and a great meeting. And also, I would like to express our appreciation for the efforts that FDA has taken in responding to the COVID pandemic while continuing to perform mission critical work in this demanding time. And as heard many times today, FDA biopharmaceutical industry are utilizing novel approaches to clinical trials, facility inspections, manufacturing, supply chain, to support continued innovation and inform timely regulatory decision-making. And thanks to this continued innovation, biopharmaceutical companies were able to deliver safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines and treatments to patients in record time. And this swift respond, uh, response to COVID-19 is a testament to effective and efficient collaboration with an industry, with FDA, other various federal agencies, and other third parties. Sustain and ongoing collaboration between the public and private sectors is essential to ensuring the safety and continuity of the supply chain and pandemic preparedness. And it's also important for industry's ability to advance and manufacture uh, existing and future innovative medicines. Thank you so much, um, Speaker Vera Shagana, and I. Uh, we, we've hit that dynamic where we allocated time based on the number of folks who registered and um, uh, needed to stick with that time commitment, but really appreciate all of the comments that were made. I'll note as well, there is a docket open for this meeting. And um, so we encourage folks to submit comments to that docket, and then they will all be captured in this together. So thank you for those who signed up to provide public comment and did so. Uh, and in fact, the docket is open until December 28th. Um, so a significant amount of time to, to provide that comment. I'm now gonna pass the microphone back to my colleague, Kevin Bugin. Um, there may be a bit of a delay as we do that. So know that in fact, Kevin is returning to the microphone and will close us out for the meeting. So I'll count you down. Kevin, please um, pick up and take us to the final session. All right, hi everyone. So I, I think we've still, by my count, have a little over 200 people still on. So I wanna thank you all for this incredible marathon session of a lessons learned, which 
Um, honestly, I mean, I think we, we owe nothing less than that, given the marathon of a pandemic or public health emergency that we're in. But I recognize, again, it's been a long day. I've been standing the entire time. It was, it was that captivating. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of quickly go through some takeaways and then get you all out of here early so you can move on and get to drinks or get to dinner. So firstly, a couple of takeaways from our two opening keynotes. Um, I think the main for me were that it's important to take the time to take stock, even though we're still in the pandemic. Um, and that's because we've made substantial progress since the beginning of this pandemic. And there were solutions that we've implemented already, solutions we may still be trying to implement and we're learning as we go now, and then solutions that we simply need to continue to work on and make sure we do implement for the next pandemic. The, the common theme I heard throughout the day was you, you can't implement many of these things in the midst of a pandemic. It's something that you have to have there already. And then initial clinical research efforts for therapeutics, at least, were very scattershot. And this created a lot of barriers to generating actionable evidence early on, at least. And um, it's tough when you have a system that's overburdened by cases, which we heard about you know, already multiple times today, when you also have to deal with those competition with those trials that maybe are not going to lead to evidence that we needed to evolve the standard of care. And then there was remarkable collaboration, uh, whether that be what was described with the active program between NIH, FDA, HHS, and CDC, the academia uh, sort of institutions and industry, or the extraordinary all of government collaboration that we saw in response to COVID-19. And this was certainly also something that we carried forward into this collaborative lessons learned effort. And, and I would like to thank again, all those participants who joined us today and stuck with it through all the panel sessions. I mean, you are also our partners, you're our collaborators in this process of learning about these lessons learned and how we can move them forward. Um, and lastly, the President's American Pandemic Preparedness Plan, which was released earlier this month, lays out a very, um, I think as Dr. Collins mentioned, resource intensive but ambitious plan for how to be prepared for future pandemics. And uh, we saw a lot of alignment or commonalities with some of the lessons learned and themes from today. So hopefully that will give us some additional assistance or support as we try to make progress moving forward. Moving into the first panel on research scoping and prioritization, um, I heard in a public health emergency, there's this strong desire to help patients. And uh, this was clearly seen with everyone jumping in, sort of all hands on deck trying to help, um, but not maybe knowing how they should help. So having a preparedness plan that can communicate what can be done from day one, um, something I, I, I love to quote, I can't remember uh, the, the person who said this, who I should attribute it to, but uh, was that from you need to, from day one, you need to randomize that first patient. Uh, we need to know how we can get that information and that guidance out so that we can work in the most coordinated and efficient ways possible. Now, when determining criteria for scoping and prioritization, I heard the need to consider scientific considerations such as the mechanisms of actions of the drugs, the type of safety databases we need, but we also need to think about scalability and the available of clinical supply, not just for the research, but of course, for getting it out to patients who will need it and manufacturing as well. And while there are immediate term goals, we need to also keep the long-term pipeline and the broader view in mind. Um, there's going to be that valley of death that we need to bridge. Um, and that's an important intermediate goal as well. How do we get from those phase one trials into the phase two and three and beyond? We need to make sure our trials are designed to yield actionable evidence. They need to be adequately powered. They need to have the right controls, et cetera. We need systematic communication channels to promote timely information sharing. Uh, you can have a great plan, but if nobody knows what it is, it's not gonna do you much good. And we need strong and continuous investment in pandemic preparedness, including infrastructure at the community and therapeutic areas, such as in the antiviral R&D program that we heard about. And I'll jump right into the next panel, which was on infrastructure and resourcing. Um, clearly there are networks and infrastructure currently and were at the beginning of the pandemic, but they exist in different states of readiness um, was the sort of note that I made. And interoperability, rapid coordination of, of new and larger networks really necessitates, um, you know, that was required was difficult in real time. And the key question, I think I mentioned this earlier is, how do we keep that needed infrastructure warm and ready? And I'll come back to that question because I thought I also heard a really, um, you know, great answer to it as well. Now, also keep in mind, I, what I heard from this, this panel discussion was the underlying infrastructure and resource circumstances were changing on a regular basis. We certainly saw this from 
the US government's response in the operation. Um, but certainly we heard this from, from our panel discussion as well. There were shifts in, of course, more needed remote and decentralized trial practices, the use of digital health tools, but it was a struggle to implement those, not, not for lack of trying or for lack of flexibilities. I think that we heard that there was great sort of collaboration between industry uh, and academic partners and regulators on, on how to implement those tools, but they were new. And, and anytime you're trying to implement something new, that can be challenging as you sort of build that self-efficacy with those tools. And then of course, I, and I called them basic needs, but the panel described sort of fundamental lacking, you know, PPE, personal protective equipment, and of course, the clinical research professionals that we would need to conduct clinical research. And lastly, the, the, this pandemic has taught us, you know, the role of emerging variants and the evolution of standard of care over time really does make this a very challenging situation to, to manage within the infrastructure and resources that we have. Also, uh, we really, a key point, and it deserved its own bullet, at least in my mind, and it goes back to what I thought was the answer to that first question about how you keep the needed infrastructure warm and ready was, we didn't have infrastructure that actually could reach out to where those patients were, those underserved and underrepresented patients who unfortunately were disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. And so we really need to engage with those community sites more and bring them into the networks identifying and addressing their needs may be the answer to that key question. Moving on to panel three, and I had to split this one into two slides because that was such a rich conversation. Um, it was just difficult to stop capturing important takeaways. Um, but I'll begin by, I, I think the way uh, Sarah and Mark had described this was the importance of right-sizing the research question and then matching that up to the capacity that you'll have at the sites from the get-go. Um, and I think inherent in that is, is thinking about that capacity at new sites and new networks. And how do you get that up to a new level of normal so that you'll have the necessary capacity to answer the right types of questions that you're we're going to be needing to respond to in a pandemic or a public health emergency? This will require engagement at community trial sites. Um, it'll, I think I took some great takeaways from Dr. Cooper as you know, remarks as well. We need to think about those social determinants of health. Um, Will you have the basic you know, access to high quality healthcare? If you can't reach an academic medical center, then that's not gonna be a medical center that can reach those patients. And then of course, we need to think about eligibility criteria and its impact on diversity. I think a lot of times we think about eligibility criteria on getting to the heart of our questions around efficacy or around safety, but we also need to think about its impact on diversity and the types of patients that are underrepresented um, in our trials. Next, the research needs to be as simplified, standardized, and as well supported as, mu as much as possible. And really thinking also about how that question or that should be addressed internationally as well. And this sort of, I, I bucketed in things such as the regulatory requirements for central or single IRBs, the administrative requirements and legal um, requirements as well, such as indemnification being much more clear and, and well understood uh, for research um, entities during a pandemic especially. And then, of course, addressing the overhead or the, the management challenges, such as managing payroll and managing the risk of taking on clinical trials, contracting and other agreements, which really can bog down things uh, and standing up a new trial. I mean, we saw amazing mountains be moved during this pandemic with some of the contracting and other agreements for some of the active trials being pulled off in a month's time. But this is something that even a month seemed way too long when you're dealing with a pandemic and you really want to try to get patients enrolled as quickly as possible. And of course, also thinking about how to expand the investigational drug and pharmacy management components. These two bullets here, particularly, I, you know, I heard a comment from Dr. Brown, I believe, was about how do we modularize this? And so you might think about those right size questions to the right size capacity to the right tools that simplify and standardize this so you can almost pick and, and match and line up what those different modules might be. And then as far as the additional takeaways, um, another great quote, I'm sorry, Dr. Brown, but uh, you were really on today. I mean, what do clinicians and healthcare providers do? Do they treat or do they respect, treat, and learn? And I think that's a, a key takeaway. And it, it's sort of the this rest of the slide is, is really channeling or, or leading off of that. Thinking about training the next generation is an opportunity to really accelerate the needed culture change for those next generations of clinical care providers or clinical researchers. And really they're one and the same. Um, you know, really integrating all the novel tools and technology, all the novel clinical research you know, that we might be doing into clinical care. And this needs to be widely, as widely available as possible. And with regards to that culture change, it's obviously needed. Um, and, and I took a couple of notes about what we need 
although this is probably not exhaustive, but we, we need true stories that are really compelling and they demonstrate a real value proposition for communities, which as we've been talking about all today, I mean, I think engaging those communities and making sure they're in the mix for the infrastructure, they're part of the clinical trial so that we execute is critical. And of course, adjustments to all the broader sort of ecosystem, the frameworks that we use to, to come up with research questions, the types of designs for studies, the incentives that we have, all to enable research in clinical care. And lastly, re relationships that will reinforce that change over time. And that could be relationships at the institution or hospital level. It could be relationships with academia or broader research entities such as the NIH or with industry or with the FDA and so on. So hopefully that was sort of the speed round version of all the takeaways. We will get these updated slides um, posted onto the Reagan Udolf Foundation website here probably in the next coming day or so, as well as the recording. Um, and as I mentioned earlier today, there will be a summary that will build on the pre-read that is currently on the, the Reagan Udolf Foundation. And if you haven't already read it, I highly encourage you to do so. And we'll try to fold in these takeaways and some of the additional comments. We'll give our panels an opportunity to, to weigh in and add anything additional there, as well as some of the public comments that we heard as best we can. And lastly, I think Susan mentioned this, the docket is open and feel free to send in those comments. I believe it's going to be open through the end of the year. Um, and once that closes, we'll be summarizing all of that feedback and there will be sort of a supplement to this additional summary report that I mentioned today. Um, lastly, but not least, again, this is a sort of a very long journey. Uh, we're trying to make changes that I think folks have been talking about in the clinical research space for years, if not decades, and I think we have a lot of convergence now, um, and it'll take everyone who's, you know, here today or was here today to help us move forward, and, and we want to thank you all for being here and, and helping us, you know, drive change and, and really make a difference so that we can be prepared not only for pandemics in the future or other public health emergencies, but just to do the, the best clinical research possible and bring that into the clinical care setting. So with that, I will close us out. Again, thank you all for participating and thank you to all our panels and for the organizers from Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA. Uh, thank you very much and have a great night.